Hey, Barry, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Awesome. So Andy's trying to connect. He's been uh, logged in for quite a while. Well, I didn't want to start it too early because I wanted to, didn't want it to record. And I guess what I can do is pause this until we're, yep, until we're ready to start. Monday's group, right? You know that was one thing. There, there is an overlap. Um, well, I'm sure it's big. I just don't know if we have everybody from each. Um, I don't know. Okay. I was going to check, and I did not have time to check. I I know it's somewhat significant, maybe fifty percent. Well, I show noon, it's about 40 people on. Yeah, we're half of what we're supposed to have, right? Yeah, a lot of people, I have a feeling I've already been contacted by several people who uh, had conflicts come up. So they were asking about the recording, which I am, I am recording. Um, they have okay. the materials. So assuming okay. that, that um, the electric and internet gods are in our favor today. <laughs> Not only. Yeah, it's ever be in your favor. Um, you know, we'll be pretty good. And I'll I'll send those out tomorrow or this afternoon when we're done. It it takes actually a fair bit of time for it to write out that size file. Okay. And we had a pretty good amount of snow and wind last night, but um, it is sunny as we speak. So. <laughs> Me too. That's. Cold as can be down here. Yeah, it was it was 35 and blowing blowing sideways. So no thanks. Kind of caught me off, off guard. <laughs> Didn't quite expect that. All right. Well, we have 53. They're coming online pretty fast. Yep. And I think I do want to. Hey, Barry. Yeah. Um, while we're waiting, I just wanted to touch base with you. I graduated from DGSU as well. I worked with George Buller then. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, you worked with Rex? Yeah. Rex is my PhD advisor. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very good. I just wanted, I saw your name on this and um, I just wanted to touch base with you. I'd heard good things about you. So, oh, hi. That's too bad. Don't believe everything you hear. I won't. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, don't believe everything you hear. I did not make a snarky comment. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. Barry and I did not know each other, but we were learning algae at the same time from two advisors who were good buddies. Oh, um, isn't that funny? Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was yeah. Rex's uh, second PhD student. I was, wow. George's, I was George's first. Oh, really? Ah. Yep. Very cool. It is. Where are, where are you now? I'm in upstate New York, Syracuse area. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, we've I'm, been working with Greg Boyer on our lake. So I'll say hello to Greg for me. Greg I and will. I friends too, yeah. All right. And you're up to 60 some. I think it's probably time to get going. Yeah, about five minutes. Okay. All righty. So let me just make sure that this is recording. It says it is. Uh, can everybody see my screen? You should see yeah. algal ecology, all things algal ecology. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Folks so should mute, mute yourselves. Okay, so I did just mute all. Mute all. Ooh, that's cool. All right. So Barry and Ken and Andy, if you want to unmute, you can, but um Hopefully I've got this set, so it'll let me, yay, it lets me advance. Life is good. <laughs> All right, so um, in case you were not at uh, Monday's workshop, this is the second follow-on workshop for agroecology control and cyanotoxins. We're going to follow a similar format. 
Um, these are our, this is our contact information, Andy, Barry, myself, and Ken. And uh, I did on Monday send out some additional articles for folks. I will send those same articles at the end of today's uh, webinar, which includes a toxin producer document that uh, Andy and Amanda Foss maintain at Greenwater Labs and a uh, um, couple other things that I think might be useful. So uh, consistent with the other day, we're pretty redundant because this is complicated material and it often is difficult to follow. So being able to uh, repeat and have you hear it more than once, I know it might get boring, but it will be helpful in the end. This is our basic schedule. So I'm doing algal ecology first, then we're gonna spend a little bit of time on um, on assemblages and questions. Then we're gonna have a short break. There wasn't a good way to put the break in. So it's gonna be a little, little less than halfway through. Then Ken is gonna do algal control and we'll have questions. And then uh, Barry's gonna talk about cyanobacteria, their toxins and um, all things about why they may or may not produce them. And then we're gonna have uh, essentially some more questions. And if folks can hang on for a little bit, if you have specific uh, blue-green taxa, uh, cyanobacteria, you would like me to put up on the scope and kind of go through ID characteristics, I'm prepared to do that. I have uh, quite a few slides made up. And if you have questions, put them in the chat. Whoever is not lecturing will be monitoring the chat. If we can't answer those or there's still extras, we can address those at the end. And um, during question time, you're welcome to, uh, un to unmute and chat as well. And uh, you can't upload images into the chat. We didn't have that happen on, on Monday. So keep, keep that in oh. mind. If, if, if you have a question, particularly a burning question that might interfere with you understanding more what's going on, put it in right away because those of us not doing the talking will answer you in the chat if we can. Yep. All righty. All yours, Anne. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> all right. So, um, why study algae and algal populations? Well, you know, we're we're all here because uh, not because we all live on pristine lakes that are lovely, but because we have issues, right? And so, algae are the base of the food chain. I, you know, cyanobacteria, especially in bacteria, primary means for incorporating carbon into the organic system. They produce uh, lakes and oceans. Produce most of our oxygen linked to trophic status and ecosystem stress. They directly affect water quality and the economic value of water resources. So the deal is, is that as humans, this is what we see, right? Um, we either see less algae or lots of algae and things happen as a result of that. And they directly affect human, uh, human wildlife and livestock safety. Uh, there have been quite a few documented wildlife and livestock deaths in Michigan, especially, as well as all over the country. So aesthetically, where uh, the presence or absence of algal blooms is going to determine how humans perceive water quality, right? Um, and I love this picture by Jennifer because that is an itty bitty little fish. Um, but the truth is, is that you, when you look at a system like here on the left, you think, oh, wow, that's got pretty good water quality. And when you look at the system on the right, you think, oh, wow, warning signs of nature, right? That looks bad. There's dead things in it. Um, and, and that's how humans perceive quality. So when we talk about population dynamics, they're highly dependent on where you are. Remember that um, we're talking about ecology and what drives these algal populations. And when I'm done talking about ecology, Ken is gonna talk about control, which is based on ecology. And I should uh, also put in a quick disclaimer. I actually have included uh, benthic algae in this as well, but I'm mostly gonna talk about uh, lake phytoplankton or suspended phytoplankton. So phytoplankton is suspended algae, so ponds and lakes of all sizes, large rivers and slow moving streams, periphyton are attached. That means they're essentially streams or rivers of all flows and sizes and the literal areas in lakes on multiple substrates. And there can be crossover among these groups. So in other words, the phytoplankton can sink to the bottom and the periphyton can get uh, by turbulence or by biological activity, cycled up into the phytoplankton, and I see that quite often. And uh, uh, periphyton that comes up into the phytoplankton is called tycoplankton. Oops, okay, so down would be good. 
There we go. Okay, so a uh, little bit of terminology about substrate. So planktonic and pelagic is going to be out here in the middle of the system. And then we have all sorts of different words to describe where things are. So epipelic, which means on the mucky stuff, epilithic, epilithic on rock, epiphytic on plants, epizoic on animals. Um, and, uh, you know, we have metaphyton and epiphyton and all sorts of words to describe where these things are. Pelagic is going to be open water, profundal is deep water, and littoral, which is this area here, uh, is near shore. And, and I believe that little er the littoral area is pretty important to lake ecology. So this is also dependent on stratification, right? Because it's going to affect where these things are. And the stratification is affected by weather, by lake morphometry, by your geographical location, the water chemistry, the biology, and, and any kind of management activities, right? So there are some management activities that specifically disrupt stratification and some that try not to disrupt that stratification. So we in the in, uh, Northern Temperate Zone are often sitting in a dimitic uh, system where uh, it's gonna turn over twice a year in the spring and the fall. And of course we have all of these uh, modifications to that. If you're down south, you might only set up for a very short period of time, like a polymythic shallow system that will uh, mix with strong wind. My dissertation lakes were in the UP of, uh, of Michigan, which is essentially uh, this, um, and they were spring merimythic. So they didn't turn over but once every seven to 10 years, they had a lot of solutes in the, in the deep hypolimitic zone. So we are often looking at things up here in the, uh, in the epilimnion and sometimes here at the oxygen uh, maximum, which is where the metalimnetic oxygen or metalimnetic algae would be. And so this is often where we are focusing our, uh, our studies in the summer period. So what you see is what you get, right? Um, kind of, sorta. So population presence at any one time is a result of two co-occurring processes, growth and loss. And so uh, it's interesting because if you ask sixth graders, I teach sixth graders, uh, you know, when algae photosynthesize, they say during the day and you ask them when they metabolize and they automatically say during the night. Um, and of course, those that's kind of uh, a simplified way of looking at it. They are always metabolizing. And yes, they are essentially photosynthesizing during the day, but that's not the only way they grow. So primary productivity is going to be controlled by light, temperature, nutrients, algal physiology, competition, heterotrophy, uh, which is the coolest thing on the face of the earth, augments primary productivity, think of it like a second job, and that's dependent on physiology and environmental conditions. We do also have some physical things released from the sediment, which means it's recruitment uh, from the bottom uh, sediments and colonization, which is coming either from outside the system or from upstream or aerially. So primary productivity, uh, remember that most biological processes max at an intermediate point, and so they're going to max an intermediate light, and then they're going to start to tail off and bleach after that. So here is where you're seeing most of the photosynthesis occurring, and up until that point, it's uh, um, somewhat exponential. So it's going to be modified by what the temperature, what the light regime, nutrient availability, and uh, where they are physiologically. So physiological health is a thing. Algae get sick just like people. And as they are not physiologically he uh, healthy, their photosynthetic rate is going to drop off and they're going to be more susceptible to things like sinking and disease. Heterotrophy is either absorbing uh, organic compounds or by direct phagotrophy. So uh, things like dinoflagellates and cryptomonads and uh, denobrian, chrysophyte, uh, uh, dinoflagellate, and cryptophyte, they can all phagocytize. Um, and you cannot grow denobrian azenically. So it requires bacteria and or picoplankton uh, in a sample with it. Some of the diatoms like uh, Nietzsche can uptake uh, organic compounds in the water. And if we have something like these decate dinoflagellates, they produce a uh, um, uh, organelle called the pallium, and they essentially, this is a protoperidinium from a marine system, but they essentially engulf the filament of uh, diatom, suck out the contents and jettison the filament. It is the thing of horror films, but it's very cool. Release from the sediment, recruitment from uh, sediment surface due to increasing light temperature. Cyanophytes have things like aconites, hormogonia are these short little condensed uh, filaments from things like microsyra and, uh, and lingvia. 
oscillatoria and small uh, daughter colony germination and growth. Dinoflagellates will also uh, often form cysts. Here's an acne from Phanazomin and Flosaque or from Dilicospermum. And then chlorophytes and chrysophytes also have oocysts and cyst germination. Uh, by far, the ones that survive the best are the dinoflagellates, and they can be entrained from flocculate surface sediments due to turbulence or turnover. Some algae uh, are, have an ability to maintain their position in the water so that they don't go down to the bottom, and they do that by a few different ways. So one of those things is, is that they have um, a length to width ratio that helps them stay up in the water, kind of like all these arms that are like baffles, right? Uh, they can produce oil like Botryococcus and several diatoms. These are oil droplets or gas vesicles or aerotopes in the case of the cyanophytes, and, uh, and they kind of give that. Uh, shiny stuff behind backlit behind this image and that keeps the up in the water. Colonization or invasion. Um, naturally it happens through water sprays and, and aerosols and actually that is quite uh, an efficient way of transport. Flow from upstream or connected water bodies, floods, wildlife, uh, especially the proverbial duck feet. Um, and anthropogenically ship ballast water, water from boat engines and manifolds, live cells. Uh, you know, that's one of the ways that uh, invasive species get transported north in the US and man-made canals. So for the lost process, processes, we have things like you just die, you know, inevitably you're going to die. That's for all organisms on earth and that includes algae. And there's a lot of things that influence that death rate. Grazing, complex algae grazer interactions, sedimentation or burial, which is you know, the opposite of being brought back up by uh, resuspension, turbulence, sediment load, what your strategy is. Hydraulic washout and scouring, uh, which is a function of flow and velocity, circulation, and again, algal strategy. If you can get yourself to the bottom before you flow out of the system, that's a big plus, right? And then desiccation, which to some algae means you know, you're done, but other algae actually can take advantage of that. So physiological mortality, you can tell when a population is starting to wane because you start to see empty cells. Denobrian, you'll see empty lorica. In peridiniums, uh, dinoflagellates that are thecate, you start to see cyst formation. And you'll start to see empty cells and things like uh, pediastrum, monotinus, things like that. You, you'll see partial colonies. Grazing, uh, and this is my second favorite far side, um, can be both a major force in both algal quality and quantity, right? That's what um, manipulation is based on. It's top-down control. And it's consumption and nutrient re regeneration can both be factors. So grazing is, a, is an interesting thing. It can work always. So food webs are complicated and even in the simplest of systems, right? So top-down control, top-down control versus bottom-up control um, are being exercised at the same time. And factors include things like grazer size, grazer selectivity, grazer abundance, grazer specific excretion rates, all of those things uh, favor or play into what role grazing is actually going to have on the population. Things like rotifers, this is brachionis with uh, tetracellus in the background. It was interesting because you could just watch it. The corona would bring the algae into, into the masses and it would just up like a um, It was very cool. Copepods, um, rotifers are limited by their size. Copepods are actually selective. So, um, you know, cyclopoids tend to be more selective than calanoid copepods. So I always think of of calanoid copepods as the teenage boys of the world. They will eat anything they can get to. Um, same thing with daphnids. Um, daphnia are relatively generalist and their uh, ability to graze is going to be size-based. So below a millimeter, they're not as effective. And above a millimeter, they're considered more effective. And so it depends on whether you have selective, non-selective copepods, your rotifer population, and what your daphnids are doing. So growth rate, uh, resistance to grazing. So uh, it's best off if you're just not grazed, right? Um, if you can just stop the whole process before it starts, that's lovely. Uh, if you can't stop it, if you can survive it, that's even more, more lovely. Um, and so algae use a lot of strategies to avoid being grazed. Scolia trichia is quite large, but what uh, daphnids have learned to do is actually graze off the edge here, what Ken likes to call a haircut, and they will graze off the periphery of these large colonies with the uh, filaments that extend out, trichomes that extend out from the center. That's pretty poor food, right? You have to be relatively desperate to do that, but it is food and it does work. 
Um, they also can survive uh, on dissociated aphanosominin, um, but not on the phanosominin fascicles. So when they get uh, aggregated in those fascicles, they can't uh, get those into their uh, feeding apparatus and their ability to migrate both the algae and the zooplankton. So food preferences follow a general trend. Cryptomonads are the food to table, uh, farm to table food of the algae world. They're high in nutritional value. They're easy to digest. Diatoms have a lot of oils. They're good food. Greens aren't too bad, but they tend to have um, you know, more robust cell walls and then blue greens. So uh, cyanobacteria can have a lot of uh, nutrition in them and they are used in food supplements. Barry, I'll talk about that a little later. But, um, but you know, in terms of, would you rather eat a cryptomonad or a cyanobacteria, cryptomonad is gonna give you better nutrition. And the algae can respond by doing one of four things. No response, in other words, having a grazer doesn't affect you and doesn't help you. It actually can help you. It can definitely get rid of you, or at low uh, concentrations, zooplankton are eating a preferred food, which is not you. And then at higher concentrations, they've eaten all the good stuff. And now you are getting grazed as well. So there's a, th this is complicated in how algae will respond to grazers. And take into account that like there's evidence to to suggest, and, we, and this is pretty well proven science at this point, that microcystis aeruginosa blooms in Lake Erie and other lakes are exasperated by differential grazing of zebra mussels. Um, zebra mussels don't like uh, microcystis. They actually reject it, they spit it back out. And so they'll eat all the good stuff and leave behind the microcystis and their excretion uh, rates, their, their species specific excretion rates actually helps microcystis at the sediment water interface. So all things um, actually benefit microcystis and, uh, and that's a real problem in some of these lakes. So we also have sedimentation and burial, highly influenced by stratification stream, turbulent sediment load, physiological state. Again, that's gonna come up again and again. If you're not healthy physiologically, you're going to sink faster and motility. So uh, diatoms with a rafe can reposition themselves if they're buried. Uh, several things have flagella, uh, chrysophytes, cryptophytes, dinoflagellates, coraflites uh, can migrate um, purposefully within the water column. And then of course the cyanobacteria have aerotopes and they can float up as well. Hydraulic washout or scour is uh, mostly an issue with reservoirs and large rivers, has to do with rainfall and morphometry that affects the flow, what the velocity is like, both the volume and the grade, substrate type, and the last time since the last disturbance. Uh, physiological state of algae. Again, algae mats as they age um, start to accumulate um, not only a lot of detritus and dead material, but also uh, oxygen bubbles, especially with ones that have a, have a pretty high productivity going. And that will eventually cause the whole fast to let go, or in the case of cyanobacterial mats, it's just enough to actually lift that whole thing up off the bottom and it just floats to the surface. Um, and that basal attachment um, for the greens and the chrysophytes uh, can actually keep them down there for a while, but not forever. Um, cyanobacteria handle drying the best. It's actually used as a, a way to archive samples in herbaria. Um, normal hydrological cycles. So if you have an ephemeral stream, that's a great way to survive until water comes again, lower water levels in summer, dry versus wet seasons. And then of course the catastrophic kind of disturbances like earthquakes and volcanoes and subsidence of floodwaters, which leaves you dry and high and dry. Um, and you have to figure out a way to survive. Cyanophytes do that the best. So let's look at some seasonal trends in phytoplankton. Uh, remember that in the winter, we might have ice cover, we'll potentially have reverse stratification, especially in the northern half of the, uh, of the United States or in Canada. Under ice circulation can be important. Um, it's easy to think it's static uh, under the ice, but it's not, there's always circulation. It's gonna be low light, temperature is gonna affect productivity. It can be variable, but generally moderate nutrient availability and your grazer density is generally low. In the spring and the fall, you have isothermal and well-mixed circumstances, relatively high nutrient availability. Uh, lights increasing in the spring and decreasing in the fall and uh, changing uh, things like light and temperature actually can cue certain groups to do better than others. Stratification is setting up in the spring and breaking down in the fall and grazer density uh, is in transition. So it's gonna go from low to high in the spring and high to low in the fall. Over the summer, you might have stratification, uh, even in shallower lakes, it might set up and break down over uh, fast time periods. You often have low nutrient availability because it's now bound up in the algae. 
light limiting um, only with high algae or sediment levels, uh, but sediment, high sediment can be light limiting and can force your assemblage into a smaller assemblage. Temperature is gonna be vertically variable, highest near surface, vertical gradients of abiotic conditions and algae. So remember that as you have this thermocline, you're gonna have things uh, potentially going anoxic in the bottom and you're gonna have an increasing concentration of nutrients in the bottom. And your grazer densities are variable, often high unless there's fish predation. So in the winter, remember, greater the under ice movement, the greater the diatom density, they're heavy, they have uh, silica dioxide, and so they need that circulation to stay up in the water. Winter species are adapted to low light and temperature. Often the species that are there in the winter are undergoing supplemental heterotrophy, and overwintering populations often determine spring dominance. So if you have a, a both a planktothrix or an aphanosomonin population that's blooming under the ice, when that ice breaks down, those are often the first bloomers or remnants, so those are gonna bloom in the spring. So under the ice, we have a lot of cryptophytes, we have a lot of uh, chrysophytes or cryptophytes, we have chrysophytes like denobrian, diatoms, um, we have naked dinoflagellates, the gymnodiniums, uh, phanosomonin will bloom under the ice, not necessarily in fascicle form, and dinoflagellates, and then some of these non-nitrogen fixing blue-greens like Gomphospheria, Snoella, Crococcus, Merismopedia, Phanacapsa, um, pretty common. We have Planktothrix, um, and the recent work that uh, Barry and I and Josh Cooper did showed that at least in some Minneapolis lakes that this red uh, Planktothrix is in fact uh, a Garrity subspecies rubescence. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And this is in the spring. So it's as the lake is starting to break down, these uh, algae are blooming right under the ice and then they'll come up into those cracks as the, as the ice starts to melt. You do not want to ice fish in this because generally they are very good at producing toxin. They are reliable toxin producers. And you don't want to ice, fix, ice fish and collect fish uh, that you're going to eat from a lake that has an active uh, cyanobacterial bloom under the ice. So in early spring, most lakes are experiencing rapid increases in algal density, diatoms, cryptophytes, and chrysophytes, right? Those are what was going on under the ice, so they're going to uh, be more active in the, in the spring. Temperature and light are the primary control factors. Um, in the late spring, those diatoms have really ratcheted up, you tend to get large diatom populations, so you'll see tabularia and things like that, those heavily silicified diatoms, lots of asterionella and fragilaria crotonenses, along with chlorococci and greens and cryptophytes, chrysophyte blooms, uh, we have nice, big, pretty uh, denobrian colonies. Um, and the later the spring maximum, the less likely diatoms are going to dominate. Overwintering benthic uh, colonies are also going to be recruited into the benthic uh, community, plaintiff community, starting right about now. They're going to start moving up through the water column. So increasing light cues, spring blooms where nutrients are available in the late spring, grazing and algae, uh, algal settling increases during spring with rising water temperature. And the clear water phase, if you're gonna have one, uh, it seems to be becoming less and less uh, common in some of the lakes that I work on, but the clear water phase often results from these loss processes overshadowing growth in the late spring. Much of that is driven by uh, Daphne grazing. And uh, there's some, uh, in late spring, some very small, important things that bloom. And this is something that I struggled with actually for a very long time. It's not very big, only about five microns. And uh, for a long time, I keyed it to Arankinia, which is chrysophyte, but I never could find the haptonema. It does in fact have a haptonema. This is chrysochromulina. And so um, it's important if you don't have the structures you need to be patient, as long as you are consistently calling the same morph, the same thing, you can correct it at a later date and likely you're gonna be uh, relatively close. In early summer, we start to see that increasing uh, trend of light and temperature uh, continue. Nutrient availability starts to decrease as internal sources are isolated by stratification. Those diatoms are gonna have used up the silica dioxide. Uh, NMP are starting to be uh, used up by other taxa. Grazing, sinking, and metabolism are all increasing. Composition is gonna depend on the resource gradients, right? Low end P favors uh, Nostocling and blue-greens. Uh, and green, valvaki and greens, high NDP favors other chlorophytes, chrysophytes, and dinoflagellates. Um, and the NDP ratio at the sediment water interface is actually more important than what's up in the epilimnion, especially if you're concerned about cyanobacteria because they can uh, uptake phosphorus uh, and keep it on board. And there's a high variability among lakes and within lakes uh, within among years, and that's why we all have a job. 
In the early summer, these greens are going to start to increase, uh, especially the Valvakian uh, and chlorococcaline greens. So, uh, you know, things like gonium, Valvox, which occasionally I do see in plankton samples in larger systems. Crucigenia is a real common one, Desmodesmus. Um, and then we start to see these blue greens uh, appear as well. And it's not uncommon to see Dilicus firmum uh, blooming in uh, late May to early June. Uh, not as often toxic in that time period in my experience, but um, then again, I'm just one person. You can also start to get metal lemonade blooms set up. So as the lake is stratified, you're gonna have things that like to live down at depth, um, taking advantage of that. Cryptophytes, chrysophytes, dinoflagellates, blue-greens, planktothrix does not mind being at depth. Remember they bloom under the ice, so they don't mind low light. And then you have things that can take advantage of phagotrophy, things that uh, can migrate. So all of these guys are migrating uh, during a, a daily basis. The planktothrix is more likely gonna stay at depth. And you also have uroglina and uh, or your glenopsis and uh, cyanura at that same time. Late summer, you start to see a high bloom potential with the uh, blue greens, but also the thecate dinoflagellates and some of these larger desmids, especially if it's uh, got a little, a lot of uh, literal area and uh, they don't mind a little lower pH with a lot of color in the water. We get in this late summer period, the nitrogen fixing blue greens, especially the common bloomers like oleotrichia, delicospermum, phenazominin, um, Cuspididithrix, so there's a lot of new names to add to that mix. Um, may get blooms of non-N fixing blue-greens as well if N is relatively high. Uh, Microcystis technically doesn't uh, fix nitrogen, although it can take advantage of the nitrogenase that uh, phanazomina leaks. And you may get population oscillations between N fixing and non-N fixing uh, uh, cyanobacteria. And you start to get some of the stuff from the bottom float to the top, right? So you start to see these gnarly mats of Clodophora. You start to see uh, blue-green mats start to float around, uh, especially uh, lakes that have either a bit of a mat or a large littoral zone and not a ton of turbidity like Firmidium mats and things like that. And they're going to trap those gases and, and either break the uh, basal attachments or just uh, float off the bottom when they have enough uh, momentum. And we get a variety of other algae mixed in, dominance by one taxa or a few taxas is, is uh, typical in fertile lakes, eutrophic lakes. Growth um, is often nutrient limited, but dense surface growth can create light limitation for below. And grazing may be high, but also may be selective. In the autumn, you start to get whatever was left over. So uh, often when we are field sampling for NOMS, which is always in this October, late October to first week or two of November uh, time period, we often uh, usually generally can find cyanobacteria blooms with no problem. And we find a fair bit of uh, diversity and often they are producing toxin in this time frame. Raphidiopsis is a little bit different in that it uh, often starts blooming in August and doesn't go away until uh, quite late in the season, mid to late fall. And metalimnetic growths often uh, start to reach the surface when things degrade, when the metalimnion thermoclines degrading and they're brought up to the surface and diatoms start to come back again because that silica dioxide is back in the water column and they've been brought up from the bottom. And desmids, right? Desmids uh, like to be like mixing. They're big, they're heavy. Um, as the water cools, the Botryococcus will start to produce oil, and that also helps keep it up at the surface. Nutrients tend to be abundant um, after turnover. So all those, you know, what was uh, old is new again, and you've got stuff being brought up from the bottom, and the algae that are there are going to take advantage of that. So just a few notes on productivity that polar waters uh, tend to be dominated by diatoms, small flagellates, and nanoplanktonic greens, and they're essentially light and temperature controlled, but often high nutrient. Tropical succession patterns kind of fall into one of three categories. They're controlled by rainfall or river flows. There is a lack of seasonality. In other words, you have kind of a permanent summer, and there's abrupt, seemingly unpredictable shifts between stable assemblages. So uh, if you're even in subtropical areas like down in Florida, um, their, their bloom season tends to last a lot longer than something like up here. We are just now um, starting to have an easier time of it uh, processing Okeechobee Lake Okeechobee samples. Okay, wow, my computer was thinking. Um, oh, that's nice. Uh, release from light and temperature limits uh, over the course of, uh, and I have, um, oops, 
Um, promotes succession, diatoms usually dominate first and then golden algae and the clear water phase is common. So trophic gradients based on decades of study, um, more pea leads to more algae, there's some rocket science and more algae leads to lower water clarity, uh, but in a nonlinear fashion. So as we are uh, down here, what we see when you get to these really high TP levels is uh, dominance by cyanobacteria. As algae biomass rises, a greater percentage of that biomass is cyanobacteria. So more P equals more algae plus more cyanobacteria. That's not tried and true unless there's something quite different, but on average, this is uh, what we tend to see. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of transition here, right? So we get up here to the 100 microgram per liter level and you have tons and tons of cyanobacteria down here. You have quite a bit of diversity. So general pattern involves shift from diatoms and small flagellates to greens, to blue greens. Uh, as you increase trophic, trophic gradient over the summer, you see a deviation from that pattern um, due to nutrient variability. Vertical gradients can be a direct function of thermal regime and um, stratification can also indirectly affect algae through nutrient availability, keeping those high nutrients down at the bottom. And um, rapid flushing can disrupt pattern and, uh, and decrease the predictability. In the autumn, algal communities are products of summer leftovers and changing thermal regime. Mixing is a key factor, we know this, right? Nutrient leaks from bottom waters can greatly affect algal quantity and quality. And infertile systems may have a fall peak in the biomass, not a spring peak. And so I think I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna stop it here unless somebody would like to see some uh, periphyton. So Ken, do we have any questions in the chat? We, we do, and we've been dealing with them as we go. We're fine. Oh, you're fine, okay. The, the, um, the primary question that came up was which ones fix nitrogen and which ones don't. We've been discussing that technically if they've got heterocytes, the site for fixing nitrogen, that's a giveaway. If they don't have those, it's harder but that there are some that can create micro anoxic zones and have the enzymes to be able to do it. So all three of us answered, we all answered slightly differently, but it's the same message. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is um, I'm going to shut down PowerPoint here and stop the share. Okay. And I'm going to bring up my microscope and come over to my microscope. Okay, she takes a while to come up to speed here. I'm gonna start with, um, with one of those uh, taxa that can do microstratification when they create little mini anoxic zones and that's microcystis. So do, 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 do. Um, I don't know why sometimes my microscope doesn't wanna boot quickly, but if I leave it on when I start, then uh, it tends to take up a lot of resources and that's not necessarily good either. Okay, so this is uh, that microcystis. So, oh, that was right. Behind. Not showing yet. Not showing yet. Well, that's okay, because I've got I've to share it. Um, okay, so can you see that now? Yep, you're good now. All right. Okay, so this is microcystis, two different species that co-occur. This is microcystis uh, Wessenbergii, and this is aeruginosa. And one of the things that is typical for aeruginosa are these little itty bitty Sudanabena filaments in the colonies. So that's in the peripheral of these colonies. Um, and that's quite common. It happens more towards the end of the season. It's unusual to see that early in the season. So that's kind of something to keep an eye out for. Um, and so what I'm going to do, this is actually uh, from a, a bloom of obviously microcystis, and there were some very large colonies in here. Um, and I got impatient and started my computer software twice. So I just need to turn that one off. Okay. Um, so big colonies of this Wessenbergii, and then that's interspersed with very big colonies of aeruginosa. 
whether they're the same species or not is up to uh, up to debate. So I probably am going to take this moment to uh, talk a little bit about some of the presentations at NOMS, mostly uh, uh, Theo Dreyer's presentation on the genetics of these different algal genera. And he just published a paper uh, in Harmful Algae um, that looked at the genetics of some of our most common toxin producers in the Dolichospermum, Phanosomnin, uh, Cuspididothrix, some of these new genera. And um, it was confusing because it looks as if they're highly related. Uh, and he is calling for all of them to be called ADA clade or going back to Anabena. But uh, I'm going to maintain what I currently call things because uh, he agreed that ecomorph to the species level makes sense, that there are reasons these things are the way they are, just like Ken talked about on Monday with some of the things like Cynodesmus, Desmodesmus. And so ecology is important. And uh, I'm going to keep calling him what I've been calling him until somebody can really, really fully convince me otherwise. Um, this is Planktothrix. And uh, Planktothrix, uh, all this, air, this, this um, kind of light refractive stuff tells you that there are aerotopes there. And those aerotopes often show up as brown, um, which is brown, 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 and Plantothrix is no different. So it has cells that are about as long as wide, depending on where you are in the filament and truncate uh, conical ends. And so you can also see some of these little individual um, pseudanabanas in this aeruginosa colony much better. So what I'm gonna do is switch to some assemblages. Um, so this is a eutrophic lake from the Northeast. So, um, so we're talking up in Ken's uh, neck of the woods, Massachusetts, New Jersey. We're on the track. Let me mute folks. Can you mute please? Yeah, somebody's got some background noise there. It'll allow me to mute folks, but for some reason I'm not seeing that. Um, okay, so in the northeastern part of the United States, this is a cryptomonad, um, and I am on uh, what I would call true 400. When I count, I count at 500 actually. Um, but this guy is about uh, 10 microns. It's a little cryptomonas, and that is a single Veroninchinia cell. So uh, not uncommon to see Veroninchinia uh, break apart, and that's exactly what it did. And it's very common to see Veroninchinia in singlets or doublets. Um, and sometimes that's a little easier to see when you go on to bright field, only because phase causes that halo around things. And now you can kind of see where you actually have a doublet there and you've got a singlet there. Um, these are uh, relatively, ah, relatively unconcentrated samples. So we're essentially seeing them as we would out in the out in the system. So as we go through the sample, what you can kind of see is there, there's some clues about what might be here. So yes, we are concentrating on blue greens, but we have a small taxa, picoplankton in this sample. This is Broninchini, it's falling apart. This, um, if I can get my, and I would like to put my scope, um, let me see if I can get it to behave. Pull this over to the side. That right there is a Chrysosphrella spine. Um, so Chrysosphrella is a colonial chrysophyte. It has, this is from Longispina. Um, it has uh, long spines, two per cell that it can wave around. And so there is a fair bit of diversity in here. Um, this is a Lugal's preserved sample. So one thing that you tend to see in Lugal's preserved samples is a lot of clumping and aggregation. And that is uh, pretty universal actually. So here's a Delicospermum filament, trichome, um, although it does, yeah, it has a little bit of mucilage, so it would be, it would be a, a filament. And then uh, phanosominin that is in different states of preservation. And then there's a whole bunch of itty bay little picoplankton spread throughout here as long as single and doublets from Veroninchinia. So, and also here is Cynodesmus. So when you're counting, when you're looking at assemblages, one of the things that might help is one, to be able to focus up and down 
You're going to need a phase scope, but being able to go to bright field or another enhancement also can be helpful because now all of a sudden that uh, halo that shows up when you're under phase goes away and you can see that there's uh, Cynodesmus colony in the middle of this as well. And uh, again, easier to see when you are right there. He's right there. So, and then you've got single and doublets from Bronin Chinny along with some picoplankton spread throughout here. So trying to count this uh, can be challenging. And even if you homogenize the sample, you are likely to get, um, you're likely to get those aggregations, which can be quite frustrating. So let me put it back on phase. So remember, we're, we're still in the Northeast, so it is common to see large phantasominin blooms in the Northeast uh, in the late summer in a very eutrophic system. Here is a small Bronin chinia uh, aggregation that hasn't yet fallen apart. Remember, it has a really difluent, nebulous kind of sheath to it. Uh, the algae sort of jettison out, even though they're somewhat stocked within the sheath, the periphery of the sheath. And uh, that's most of the major stuff in this particular sample. There's a few other interesting things, but Broninchinia, Delicospermum, we have a, a large single uh, green there. And, um, and then this little guy down here is Rhodomonas. So let me show you some of those things a little closer. So here's the Broninchinia cells that are just kind of hanging out. Here's a single green. This is the Delicospermum. Ah. Stop that filament. What I want to do is go down here. And that is uh, what we would call Rhodomonas or Plagiocelmus. And uh, it is one of, it's the smallest uh, photosynthetic um, cryptomonad that you're going to see in these systems. Okay. All right. Um, now I'm trying to figure out what I did to my. I want it to go back. Oh, there we go. Oh, I like that even better. That's much better. Okay. And again, more Verona and Chinia. It's notice that these cells are just sort of kind of spread all throughout the sample. So let's look at cell plus system. And we're going to look at the urban loop. So Southwest uh, is a lot more complicated and um, will cause you tons more uh, heartburn. So this is uh, the infamous Raphidiopsis, and um, I, I am because Raphidiopsis and Cylindrospermopsis are the same thing, uh, and we know this now. Not much that Theo could say would change that. <laughs> so that's a small filament of it there. Here's some picoplankton, and then there's some more of it down here. This is an Alicosyra uh, filament. It uh, is dead. There's no cell content, so you wouldn't count that if you were counting. It does have attached bacteria. This is Marismapedia. Um, it's the smallest one and common actually in southern systems. It's quite common in southern systems. Here's another. So three things to key in on. Um, in these southern systems, both southwest and uh, southeast, you see a lot more diversity. So and what I see is, is I see a Chlamydomonas that has dropped its flagella. Um, almost all Chlamydomonas will drop their flagella at some point during preservation. This is uh, in the Chrysogenia, Chrysogeniella group. And then here is another Raphidiopsis. And um, you know, you're looking for a pointed end, one or both ends to be pointed in Raphidiopsis. And if I increase the size, what you can see is that uh, you see the cell wall for this particular Chlamydomonas, and then that's where the flagella would uh, exit the uh, exit the cell wall. That is a little probably a chrysophyte, and then here is the Chrysogenia, and here is our um, uh, Raphidiopsis. So when we're trying to tell the difference between the greens and the blue greens, um, you're looking for things like cell wall, cell structure. Um, you're looking for uh, a difference in cell size. Um, even though uh, cyanobacteria do have differences in cell size, it's their specialized structures. The general vegetative cells are often approximately the same size. Um, and you're never going to see anything like a pyrenoid or, uh, you know, a flagellum or um, starch or anything like that in cyanobacteria. So see, this looks pretty homogenous. 
all you could see is the cell wall, but you're not uh, uh, this, the difference between the cells, but you're not seeing a, a robust cell wall because that's not the kind of cell wall that they have. Over here in our Chlamydomonas, we can see that there's a fair bit of structure in there. There's the pyranoid. And then in our um, Crucigenia, Crucigeniella, we can see that it's got a cell wall, that there's contents with each of those cell walls. And then you can see the other little guys floating around in here. And I can uh, guarantee that those are picoplankton. And um, they will uh, fluoresce brightly, uh, and they have a lot of impact on the ecology of the system. Okay, oh, here's a nice Raphidiopsis uh, with the help of a, and, and this is actually perfect. So, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, let me make this a little bit smaller because I want to our friend over here. So this is Raphidiopsis that has a heterocyte, uh, a, a fully formed heterocyte at this end and what looks to be a forming heterocyte at that end. And then we have a much smaller filament that uh, is still pretty big, but not small enough to be called Dactylocopsis. And we uh, used to segregate this into uh, Raphidiopsis and this to Cylindro. So now that we know that these are both Raphidiopsis, I maintained my uh, codes for curled and straight uh, Raphidiopsis. And then I created a new code for thin Raphidiopsis so that it, this, for, this form has to mean something. Um, and then this guy over here, notice the cell constrictions, right? So there are a number of things that that could be. And um, the problem is, is that uh, you really don't have any idea what that is because you don't have much to help you, right? So as we're looking at it, you bring them to the center. And, and before yeah. you move too much, you have a live question about telling the difference between Raphidiopsis and something like mono -raphidium. And of course, you just covered the two forms of it and how challenging that can be, but if you want to address that now. Yeah, so mono uh, is a green algae. And as it turns out, it has two things that are going to help us. Um, it does form starch, but hardly ever. I rarely see monorephidium with starch. But what it does have is it has a cell wall. And so at some point in that filament, you're going to be able to differentiate, especially at the tips, at the ends, um, where the cell wall start and the cell contents end. You should be able to see that. If you have fluorescence, which I realize many of you don't, um, I do, and I do use this, they fluoresce very differently under blue light excitation and under green light excitation. So the monorophidium is going to kind of be yellowish red and the, and the blue greens are going to be kind of a dim yellow under blue light and a bright fluorescent orangey under green light excitation. And in the center of the chloroplast for monorophidium, because remember, cyanobacteria don't have formal chloroplasts, they just have their pigment and thylakoids because they're bacteria. So in monorophidium, the uh, photosynthetic product is in chloroplast, and in the center of their chloroplast is a break. And so you can see that central break even in the tiniest monorophidiums. And so that's what I look for if I'm wondering. Uh, oh crap, what do I have? Do I have a really, really thin Raphidiopsis? Do I have a Dactylocopsis or do I have a monoraphidium? And I'm looking for that break uh, in the chloroplast in the center of that chloroplast. Um, you know, uh, monoraphidium generally does not have multiple twists like this, it's got one. Um, and so they're lunate or they're twisted lunate, but they're not multiple. They're not gonna be like this for the most part and they're straight and when they're straight, they're big and there's only one cell. If you have something that big on the 10 to 20, I've seen them as high as 25, 30 microns for the really big ones like Griffii, um, monorophidium Griffii, it's huge compared to single uh, cyanobacteria cells. They're gonna be five to six microns. If you have really big ones, you're gonna have um, something like a, a, phantosom, a phantosominin filament with less aqua where the end cells are quite extenuated with a, a highline cell wall, but the central ones are short. Um, or you're going to have something like trichia that radiates from the center with the very terminal cells being long, but the central ones and the, and the ones at the center of the colony are going to be much, much shorter in the three to six micron range. So the size difference in the cell length is actually quite substantial. And uh, there is a really teeny tiny monoraphidium um, depending on what you choose to call it. Um, I call mine Capricornutum, but there's, there's also Minutum and, and other small ones, nannies. Uh, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but um, the really tiny ones that are in the three to five micron range. 
And actually you can see the chloroplasts in those and they do look very significantly different from potentially similar cyanobacteria. Does that help? Did that answer your question? So Ken, did they have other, uh, did they have other questions or was, do you think I hit all the highlights? Yes, you're good. Okay, cool. All right. So this beastie, um, you know, it has aerotopes. Um, and so that makes you wonder whether it might not be something like uh, part of an aphanosomin and a really thin aphanosomin and um, like a gray seal or a spherospermopsis be the terminal cells on a spherospermopsis or pseudanabena. Um, and the thing is, is that unless you get a bunch of these, you're not gonna be able to tell. And so I'm gonna count that and reserve it in a cyanobacteria filament category until I get more information and can comfortably put it into something. And if I can't, I roll it back. So you don't even have enough information for this short guy to, uh, to put it into an order, honestly. So it's gonna stay a small blue green filament until I get some more information. Um, and, and you have to be willing to do that when you're counting. Um, we know it's a blue green, um, confidence is cyanobacteria, but the question is which one? And these things fall apart on preservation, especially in the gauze iodine. So you need to be looking around. It doesn't hurt to scan your sample uh, when you're first counting. And, um, and then you can kind of see, oh, haha, <laughs> not the screen anymore. Um, you can kind of see that, that big difference between this uh, thinner rifidiopsis and uh, what may be uh, something, and I'm still not willing to give it a name. <laughs> um, we have this. So something like this can be hard to tell because it's kind of small. And um, what, don't be afraid when you're looking at wet mounts, which is not a bad thing to do when you start to kind of hit your cover slip and flip things. And when we flip this, what we see is, is that actually each of these is a couple cells in different orientations. Um, so there's two here, two here, two here. And uh, if we go to bright uh, field, they look reasonably homogeneous, right? Um, but see this here? See that there? Um, make this a little bit bigger. Now it starts to get pixelated, but um, but probably uh, this is um, my best guess was is it's it's tetastrum, which is a green. Um, it just doesn't have a lot of detail to help you, and it's starting to divide. So the way that these cells are in here, um, I'd want to see more of them. But uh, my best guess is that it's probably tetastrum. This usually that has little spines on it, which you can't see here, but which you can't see. But glabrum does not have spines to test. Yeah, they, they can be spine. really tiny. I know. Yeah, really, really small. So those cells are uh, around two and a half, three microns. That that's a real hard one, folks. Looking at that, it is very hard. Um. So oh, and here's another one that's that easier. is more of a help. So yeah. so. And that makes me even more confident that that last one was yep. in fact yep. uh, tetastrum. And there's often in these Southern systems, what you see is a really high species diversity. So you will often see multiple species of things like tetastrum, crucigenia, your blue greens are gonna have multiple species to their delicos. Um, it, it is uh, these Southern systems that are highly productive have a lot of diversity to them, a lot. So then if I make this bigger, what you see you is now go. you see these spines. Yeah. This is storage for me. And then if I go to bright field, bring my light down. Again, I'm not seeing a whole lot of detail in these cells, but a couple things. One, see how the cells are lining up against each other. And there is zero way that a cyanobacteria has spines. <laughs> so even though you can't see what you think you might want to see, which would be things like cell walls and pyrenoids, um, some of these smaller blue greens don't. Uh, don't easily uh, or always produce uh, pyranoids, especially when they're growing really fast. So just be aware of that, that um, I know that they can produce starch, but like everything in nature, that doesn't mean that they will. And so that's just one of the things that you can use when you're looking to identify something. 
it might have a little bit higher. The thing about phases is that sometimes if you're looking for some of these uh, other things in a darker background, it phase has a halo. And so you get this kind of kind of edge around everything that you look at. And if it's relatively dense for what you're looking at, then uh, it gets washed out. So here is a single uh, fragile area. So this would have been in Synedra previously. And based on the end cells, not great, not uh, super well preserved, but my best guess is something like filiformis. Um, if there's a capitate end on there, it would lean more towards uh, graceless or yeah, graceless. But the thing is, is that in Tanera, but you have to have acid clean material for anything like this to get it past the genus level. And then we have our ubiquitous small aphanocapsas in the background, cells evenly distributed throughout the, throughout the mucilage. And then that typical uh, aggregation that happens in the galls. Now see that movement? Um, that's Brownian movement, that's not real movement. Uh, the sample is fairly dead um, and has been for many, many years. So uh, you'll get that movement. Um, if you see everything moving, moving then you know you've underpreserved your sample. And then here's our he terminal header site. And you can actually, if you're up at a high enough magnification, you can see some of the cell it, walls on the opposite. We have the identification of where this one's from. Uh, I don't, all you have it labeled what, what, is- I think it's one of mine. What does the label say? It just says uh, eutrophic southwest. Let me go pull. South, oh. it's, it's, it's Lake Waco. Oh, Texas. is it Waco? <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So now what I'm- mind, We had somebody commenting on Texas algae, so. Oh, yeah. Teeny, tiny stuff. Teeny, teeny, tiny stuff. And uh, it will uh, make you very, very frustrated very fast because normally you have bigger things and clearly don't have bigger things. Um, and then again, let me get this back to what I'm seeing. So this is from, uh, this is also one of Ken's samples that's labeled eutrophic urbanly. So uh, we see much more uh, green dominated systems. So we have desmodesmus, remember that's the old synodesmus with spines and ornamentation and um, some single blue, uh, single greens in here. And we've got chrysogenia, excuse me, which is that green that's in the quadrat. And that pattern is actually really consistent in the sample. Um, here's something else that you tend to see. So this is also a Lugal's preserved sample, and I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger in a moment. But so we have a few things. So if you're trying to identify, okay, what, what's in my sample? What, you know, do I need to be in blue green mode? Do I need to be in green mode? Do I have chrysophytes? Do I have greens, right? So I, I see structure. So I'm seeing spines, I'm seeing cell walls. That tells me all, I, I probably am gonna be in heavy green mode, same thing here, but you can't really tell what that is. And the reason is because of that halo. And so I'm gonna take it off of phase and put it on bright field, focus up and down. That is one of your best tools. And those are ovate samples. I'll make that bigger in a moment. And those ovate uh, cells are from oocystis. So let me bring this guy up here. I'm gonna make him bigger because when Desmodesmus does this, um, life is good. So see, these are the pyranoids, very nicely done. Here's the spines, even has a couple of other spines. There's probably a medial line through here. Notice how the protoplasm is pulled away from the cell wall. That is consistent with long-term preservation. Um, it just happens and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, but knowing that that's there, if you're calculating a biovolume, you're gonna calculate based on this whole cell. It's not that the protoplasm was always drawn away from the cell wall. When it was living, it was not. Um, and there's a couple other things and then I'm gonna show you something else. So here is our, our dividing oocystis. So here's some of the ovoid cells and there's some in the background. Here's another green up here again. Here's our double cell wall. I would just call that a single celled green. And, um, and then I have this. So the question is, what is that? Um, so pretty sure based on the fact that there's granules in there and it looks kind of aerotopy, there's two Confusa of them. Diffusococcus obscurum. Diffusococcus obscurum, obscurum until you go a little <laughs> south. When you go a little south. Uh -huh. And what you see is, and this is why it's important to look throughout your sample, 
that is a microcystis colony. Yeah. So in that very first sample we looked at in the Northeast, we had Gronchinia, the old Celia spherium nagelianum. Um, but uh, now we have microcystis and microcystis does exactly the same thing. The cells are shed from, from the colony and they just slowly break out over time, more so in, uh, in uh, Lugol's iodine than they are in, um, in glutaraldehyde. Um, but they will do it in any preservative and they do it to some extent even being live. And if you bring it onto phase, now you can see that there's a sheath, the sheath is slowly contracting and that there's a lot of empty space there. That might be because the population was already senescing or because those cells have been shed. And then you see a whole bunch of, you know, synodesmus. Here's some more, um, some more oocystis up here in the corner. So as you're looking around the sample, the other thing to look at is uh, this. And this is Alicocyra that um, is not happy. Uh, it's starting to break apart. If you preserve these things for too, very, for too awfully long, then, uh, then the silica dioxide starts to dissolve and it'll start to break down in the uh, different parts of the, of the frustral, of uh, different valves will separate and things like that. So again, uh, technically you would need to acyclean. Uh, this one's actually quite large and it wouldn't take a whole lot from, uh, for you to figure out, okay, if you put it in some nafrax at a thousand, even like this, you'll be able to see enough of a pattern on here and with these, uh, with these spines that you could figure out what it is. There's a couple of choices, it's dry or straight. Um, so it's something on the order of um, Munziensis or something like that. And I'd have to look at it a little closer than I wanna do right now to speciate it. And again, there's single celled greens like this and um, which might be falling apart, uh, Mesitospherium, Dictospherium, or Desmodesmus, and or Ocystis. All those things are telling you reasonably high nitrogen, even though you have microcystis here, which is not an infixer, right? Um, even though you have microcystis here, you still have quite a few greens. So the, the uh, indications are that this is a high nitrogen system uh, with a lot of uh, nutrients available, not necessarily low nitrogen, or we would see more heterocystic blue greens. I did also, oh, I like Truberia. This is Truberia. I have to show you because it's just like the water bear of green algae. It has these spines that come off either three or four of them and that differentiates the species. And um, it's one of those things like a cryptomonas that you always can recognize. And then that is a single microcystis cell. So um, yeah, not a ton of diversity, right? So the, the most diversity we've actually seen so far, oh, here's a, oh, this is a pediastrum. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's spaces in there. Um, our choices are pediastrum or pseudopediastrum. Um, but, uh, you know, high number of greens, the blue greens we've seen have been non-nitrogen fixing. And so this is telling us it's high nutrient, high nitrogen system um, for the most part, at least that's what's available to the algae at the time the sample was taken. I do want to show you uh, Euglena sanguinea. And I want to show you Lake Okeechobee as well. Okay, so, huh, that was nice. Okay, again, this is a preserved sample. So this is what it looks like under phase. Um, it has uh, actually uh, hematocrit in it, although if it's been preserved for very long, you don't see much of that original red color. And uh, that pretty much holds true for here, but you can see kind of a hint of it as I come off a of phase, you can see there's a little bit there. Um, it uh, is what we call metabolic, which is why it stayed in Euglena. So what that means is, is that if I go to a hundred and I search around, what I'm gonna see is not always this beautiful kind of what we, what we consider consistent Euglena um, morphology but we're gonna to start to see other kinds of morphologies like this. So notice how much wider this is here um, than it is at the end where the rostrum is. And that kind of variation exists all throughout the sample. So these are in fact the same thing. Um, and that is pretty hallmark for uh, Euglena blooms and for especially for Euglena sanguinea. 
Now they did do a pretty major uh, work on the genus Euglena and many of the Euglenas got put into Lepisynclus um, and Morphamina, I'm probably saying that wrong, uh, for Facus. Uh, so there, there's a lot of variability uh, in terms of where they put things, but they like the blue greens maintain the species names. And a lot of the Euglena split was based on whether the cell was metabolic or not. In other words, whether it'll change shapes, be uh, moving as it's and changing shapes as it's swimming around. So don't expect Euglena to just be that nice, lovely Euglena, uh, you know, elongate with a flagella at one end and a rostrum at the other end. These things uh, will change shape a lot and they are gonna of course freeze based on the point at which they were preserved. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to 200. And okay, so this is the other question folks may have, um, and this is hard, and I struggle with it as well. I don't know if Andy does. Andy's much better than I am. But um, so this is Lake Okeechobee, and we for sure have Raphidiopsis, straight morph Raphidiopsis with a uh, conical header site, and, um, and uh, it's only, you know, a couple microns wide. Um, not very wide at all. And then we have these things in here and there's quite a lot of them. Now, after you look at this thing for quite a while, and honestly, if I have a sample like this, uh, I'm gonna count this at a thousand X because I can see better. Um, I need to turn up my, my, there we go, my microscope light. So that is a free uh, Raphidiopsis heterocyte. And when we go back to our Raphidiopsis filament and look hard, um, it can be quite challenging to figure out, is this a Raphidiopsis where the heterocyte has come off or is it a um, Sudanabana or is it a Plantilimbia limnetica? Well, I don't think it's Plantilimbia limnetica because it doesn't have a sheath, but sometimes you have to be high to see that. Um, but uh, jury's still out about just how much of this sample is Raphidiopsis probably that is for sure. Um, and how much is Sudanabana? And then I want to find a, uh, here's another short, got a heterocyte on one end and just one cell. So you could tell that it uh, was senescing at the time the sample was taken. Mm -hmm. And so it's not giving you a lot of help. Now, somebody had asked, um, I'm sorry. Oh, that was me, sorry. Oh, what do you want to say? Uh, no, I, I think most of what you showed was, was, was pretty opposite. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, I think so. Yeah. That's our um, friend. Yeah, our friend. Yeah. Um, and m looking at this cell, I think that is very likely a proacony. Don't you, Gandhi? What's that? A proacony from Raphidiopsis. Or just a long header site. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not sure. It, it um, really weird. Yeah. yeah um, it's tricky when, when, you know, when they have header sites at both ends and they both fall off. But then you have yeah. both ends. So that's that's the hardest time. Usually at least you have at least one end that's conical a little bit, you know. Yeah. But this, this stuff here is tricky. It looks like it had a lot of double heterocytes and dropped them. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of free heterocytes in these samples. Um, and somebody was asking earlier about monorophidium. There is a very slight hitch in the center of that cell. And um, it's not as easy for you to tell, but I can tell that actually the protoplasm falls away from. Uh, the terminal part of the uh, cell there, and it does the same on the other end, but it's not as easy to see. I'm artificially, uh, in, you know, increasing the size of this, so not very helpful, but I can see that hitch is there. This How is a help. The difference between a proto heterocyte or a, and, and an amateur heterocyte. So, a pro heterocyte, is that even a thing? Um, an immature heterocyte, I don't know. I've never called a heterocyte pro. I'm joking anymore. around, I'm joking around. We're gonna lighten it up a little. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, they have a nice high line so all. That's how you tell. Um, and I lost what I was talking about earlier. Sorry, missed the joke, sorry. Um, this is Alakasira that is uh, much healthier than what we saw before and, and obviously a different species. It's much smaller and uh, when you're trying to figure out Alakasiris, often, uh, depending on what your sampling goals are, you don't need to know what this guy is. I don't see little U's here, but again, I'm artificially, well, I don't know, I might see them there. 
it's uh, the obvious choices are ambiguous granulata. I don't see spines, but not all alka granulata has spines. It does, though, have discoid chloroplasts. So you are going to see, you're going to be able to get alka to genus uh, quite reliably because you have these two part cells and the uh, chromoplasts are discoid. So nice uh, golden, beautiful golden color, and um, pretty easy to pretty easy to see. And kind of keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I want to find the other really mean uh, culprit in this lake, and that is I'd like to find it not in the middle of something. Um, I'm looking for planktonlimbia that you can actually see what I want to show you. And there we go. So this guy here, um, Hetty Kling and I argued about this for a very long time. So again, we got free heterocytes, some chunked up uh, Raphidiopsis here and up here, and then Marismapedia here, and then this guy. And so what I want to do is bring this here. This is Planktolimbia. So empty sheath, and then some part of the sheath has the cells. And those cells actually do have uh, cyanophysian granules in them if you can get big enough and close enough. Um, but you can tell that it's tiny. Uh, it's um, you know, 0.5 to 0.8 microns wide. And, uh, and the sheath isn't a whole lot wider than that. Really tiny, really small. It has several species, uh, two common curled species, um, uh, Microspora and Contorta, and then this is Limneticus. There's also Subtilis, which is a bit bigger. Um, in this case, you would count this one because it has cell contents in it, but you would not count this one because it does not. So, well, yeah, it does. See right there and right there. So this is the other thing that we uh, need to have a real quick discussion on. Again, thank you for being pointed. Know for sure that that's Raphidiopsis. Um, any, I count anything that has a chloroplast. I don't try to do the mind meld thing uh, or the Vulcan grip with algae. If it's got a chloroplast or chromoplast, I assume it can uh, photosynthesize. And that makes my choice of whether to count something or not count something as long as the cell's intact um, as being uh, live and capable of photosynthesis. If the cell's broken or if there are no cell contents, then it does not get counted. And here is a larger. Marismapedia. So you could tell that there's several Marismapedia um, uh, species in here as well. And of course, tons, tons of free heterocytes. Thank you so much. And another nice uh, Limnetica. Raphidiopsis and Planktolimbia, Studanabana, commonly co occur. So if you see one of those, start looking for the others. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? No, we've kept up with it pretty well. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, oh, here's, yeah, this little guy. And they have um, moved this into another genus. It used to be in Phacus. Um, and I want to say it's Morphamina. Does that sound right, Mono Andy? Monomorphina. Monomorphina, thank you. Um, I was close, very close. That's why I have it in my program, so I don't have to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it has a spiralized, it has a, a, you know, that spiral pattern in its test, um, which is really rather cool. And uh, they, uh, you know, moved a whole bunch of these euglenoids around. Again, they, they uh, conserved the species. So you just have to know what the old species name was. Okay, so we are at uh, 117 by my clock. Um, and we have a quick 15 minute break. Um, I'm just gonna go check in downstairs, um, hit the restroom, and then I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. And if anybody wants to unmute and chat about stuff, uh, we'll be all back by that point. Um, I'm, so I'm unmuted now. So put the video back. Oh, yay. Well, Again. I just I just ran through the questions. There was only one that I, I didn't see that we really addressed. It was a question about um, aconites and phosphorus uptake and everything else. And that's all sort of stuff we covered in the taxonomy. But 
uh, the, the, the resting stages sit down there. It's not that they're absorbing phosphorus. When they break and start growing and dividing, then they do have ready access to phosphorus that's there in the sediment. And yes, if it's phosphorus in the pore water, it's very readily accessible and they'll grow on it. So a lot of these blue greens get their start on the lake bottom. They don't start as planktonic organisms. They're growing at the bottom, taking advantage of phosphorus release from anoxic sediments. And even if the water above them isn't low oxygen, the sediment is low oxygen and that phosphorus is available. And that's what lets them take off. And they don't have their gas vacuoles yet, you know, the aerotopes. So they grow for a while, then they form them and that's what floats them up and they come with excess phosphorus with them. So you can have a bloom without actually having a lot of phosphorus in your upper water column. Yeah, they're quite maddeningly good at it as well. I always, I always think of the men in black thing, it sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is one of those, uh, another Alakasira, but uh, doesn't have as much cell contents. And I was looking, remember I mentioned those U's, they're here. Um, it's in the central portion of the cell and uh, I'd have to look a bit harder, but that's what you generally look for to distinguish ambigua from granulata. Granulata often has spines, but not always. And so granulata is gonna be straight along that margin. There's other species as well. I don't wanna simplify it too much, but but those are the most common ones. You call it ambiguous, that one there? I would, yeah. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. But yeah, not my, not my best group of algae. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're much better at the sinophytes than I am. So <laughs> you've got that. Um, yeah, I really like morph monomorphina. I just think it's super cool to look at. Yeah, that was nice because they, they, there was three species of, that look very similar and they all ended up being the same species. It's all monomorphina pyrum. So because yeah. I can never tell them apart. There was nor norstedii and pseudonorstedii. Yeah. All the same thing now, which is sweet. Yeah, thank God. Sometimes lumping is good sometimes. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop my screen share for now, and I'm going to run and take a quick break. I will be right back. Why is there a ladder behind you? <laughs> because we had a water leak in our roof uh, during, um, I think it was Tuesday. We had pouring rain on Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday, uh, pouring okay. rain on Wednesday. And so uh, Cam was here uh, during my session trying to figure out if we had a drip or we had a pour because of the way our pipes are. Luckily it's a drip. So yeah, <laughs> 1912 building. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on algal ecology or assemblages? Let me see, there's something popped up in the chat. What is this last one? Oh, uh, that was a facus, I believe, which is a euglenoid. It could be a euglena that just is contorted because it's preserved, but the, the shape of it, that's an interesting idea, a wine glass twisted at the end. Um, and their they're, facus is uh, fairly distinctive. It always has that wine glass stem to the bottom of it, and then it widens out. Oh, here's one. Oh, is, are all facus now monomorphina, Andrew? Uh, no, no, there's, there's plenty of facus left. Oh, there still are, but that particular yeah. one got changed. Yeah, yeah that, that that particular one. Interesting. Uh, a couple, a couple that were, were very similar morphologically. Yeah, I'm not sure what. So they're not, they're not like flat. Like uh, a lot okay. of one yep. of the fakes is now I think are more, okay. are kind of more, more dorsoventrally flattened. So I don't, I, okay. I don't really know what the exact criteria was. I mean, it's it's, it's molecular, of course, you know. So. Okay. So it really is more like a wine glass in the one we were looking at, whereas the true facus is pretty flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some Can of the I... fakus, like one of them, facus contortus actually twists in the middle, which is like somebody did some glass blowing. It's pretty bizarre. I've got an ecology question. Um, the workshop on Monday um, talked a lot about how the cyanos get caught in the epilimian during pretty hard stratification, but then I saw a later talk um, later in the week where there was a lot of phycocyanin in the hypolimnion. Um, so can you get blue-green blooms in both? Well, if you're down in the hypolimnion, by definition, you're out of the light. So yeah. you're not likely to have an actively growing bloom. If you're talking about being near the, the thermocline, you could be in the upper few feet of the hypolimnion. That could be an actively growing bloom. In yeah, fact, I saw it's that. Not, 
What's but that? the phycocyanin threw me off because it was so high in the hypolimnin. It, but it could also be detrital as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't, I don't know the talk you're referring to, so I don't know if they were talking about the whole hypolimnion, part of it, whatever. When you get to the very bottom, you will often get high signals, particularly for chlorophyll that aren't chlorophyll. It's actually organic matter that's also fluorescing. That's the problem of doing all this stuff by fluorescence without ever looking at it. You can get misled. I don't know that that's true for phycocyanin, but again, the blue modes, I might have that in the control talk, but I think not. You know, you can get them coming off the bottom, like we just talked about with a resting stages, germinate and get growing right on the bottom and then they float up by forming the aerotopes later or they can grow at the thermocline getting just enough light from above and more nutrients from below or they can be in the upper water growing there if there's enough nutrients to make it work what we're seeing more and more these days are really the bottom or the thermocline starters becoming the blooms it's not that common to have it be organically grown just in the upper water column, unless you've got like a stormwater pond or something that's constantly getting lots of nutrients. All three are possible. So, so in the chat, there's a couple of questions. I'm gonna answer uh, the first one and I'm gonna let uh, Ken answer uh, Tom's. Um, so the question is, is there a particular phase of uh, during cyanobacteria bloom where it produces more or less toxin or is it a, a uh, function of cell number. So Barry's going to talk about this in his talk. Um, and do you want to answer it, Barry? You want me to answer yeah. it? Yeah. Right now, that is probably when they're healthy and growing and ample nitrogen is when you see something like microcystin. So yeah. that's, that's the key trigger. If you don't have enough nitrogen around, they will be stressed and can't make much microcystin. So that's one of the clues. The rest, if we knew more, we'd probably have better ways of controlling toxin production. So it's not not merely a not merely a function of cell number. So you can have oh, lots absolutely, of biomass. Absolutely, absolutely have, not. It's not. Yeah. But you know, and actually, well, I'm going to talk about it after. So yeah. Yeah, they have to. Yeah, you got got a whole lecture of that. Likewise, I'm going to talk about. Boss lock and sealing sediments and things like that in my talk. So save that one. No, nothing wrong with everybody trying to get ahead, but we got a lot more to cover. <laughs> um, yeah, we're actually relatively on time. That's kind of scary. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking at the toxicity in the water, sure, the more cells that are making toxin, the more toxicity in the water, but not necessarily more per cell. That's what you have to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the um, the other thing too about uh, you know you can use the ecology to help you identify right. So if there are things that are um, you start looking for either certain taxa that tend to appear together, or you know I would be very surprised in a in a northern Michigan lake, if I were to see, you know, major cyanobacteria blooms uh, in April, in March and April, that doesn't mean they don't happen. And so um, kind of knowing, all right, well, something's amiss. And so either I've got, it's been warm. Um, you know, if we have a, if we have a very mild winter followed by a warm, long spring, then it's going to shift over to cyanobacteria dominance earlier than it would otherwise. But, um, you know, in that, really truly end of winter in my area of the state, um, also in the Northern Midwest, I'm either gonna see remnants of under, under ice populations or cryptophytes and chrysophytes and, and diatoms that like to be up in the water. So um, you can use those associations for helping you figure out, you know, if you have to pick between two things, I, you know, unless something's really odd looking, I'm gonna pick the horse and not the zebra. You know, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington, they get cyanobacteria blooms as soon as the diatoms or even commingled. March and April is some of the hottest times of the year as far as blooms go out there. Delicosperma mm -hmm. blooms. Yeah, delicosperma especially, yeah, for sure. Causes a lot of problems for those uh, camping resorts in, in Oregon. And, and the pattern in the Southeast is different than the pattern in the Northeast is different than the pattern in Canada. Um, 
So it just depends on where you are in the US and what you're counting. If you're in a relatively consistent area, um, Texas, you get a change in tenor, but the the taxa that are there, you don't see nearly the seasonal um, variation that you would see yeah. in uh, a Northeastern or a, or a Midwest system. Yeah, Harvey Harper was talking on the first day about you know projects in Florida and what they see and dawn to me, I'm, I'm thinking he's got his seasons wrong. No, because there aren't any. There aren't seasons, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is variation. Like, you know, now we're, we're running to do Phoebe samples. We're running a mill or two mills. Uh, five mils instead of uh, a one mil, you know, but, you know, as far as, as true variation, there's not nearly the swings that you see in Northern systems. Yep. Gotta love the Midwest. Some, something to keep in mind, there's people here from all over mm -hmm. North America on this thing, so it is going to vary, but we do have a tendency in almost everything we do as people to look for yes or no answers to questions of gradient. It was very apparent with the taxonomy that it's not an X or a Y, it's an X sort of shading towards Y or whatever else. There's a lot of variability and it's not any different from the management methods. Nothing works perfectly all the time. Some things work better than others and you know we take it from there. All right, yeah. we good to go for control? We, yeah, we are good to go. And um... this is actually a little strange. This has always been the last lecture of the workshop, not that it needs to be, it just always has been, which meant I was the only thing standing between you and a good beer. It'll be, it'll be Barry's turn this year. I like this. All right, so we're gonna talk about control methods. Uh, hopefully everybody sees these slides okay. So we're now on the ecological basis for control, which Anna's already covered, but just a fast review. You know, algae blooms are a matter of imbalance between growth and loss processes. Think growth and loss. There's nothing wrong with high productivity as long as the biomass doesn't accumulate. If you're interested in fish, you want a highly productive lake. You just don't want the algae accumulating. You want them eaten by zooplankton, which are eaten by small fish, which are eaten by the big fish. It's when you get a bottleneck that we have a problem. Control seeks to reduce the growth or increase the loss. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the algae are not all alike. There are species differences, genus differences, family differences, certainly divisional differences. And I've got a suite of problem blue-greens across the bottom there. Every one of those is somewhat different. There are reasons to deal with them not identically. Um, I mentioned the mode of bloom formation earlier. You know, this organic increase in the upper waters is actually not, that's what we used to always assume was happening. It, Turns out that the growing on the bottom or in the metalimnion and floating up is much more common, uh, at least in a stratified lake. Um, so you got to understand algal ecology and gave you a good basis for that. There's entire books on this. Uh, Reynolds Plankton is a very good one. There's plenty of stuff out there. There's a lot to learn that we can't possibly cover in a short time. Okay. I talk mostly about in lake methods but I've gotten a bad rap at times because they didn't cover the watershed well enough. Watershed management is always job one. If you have a problem watershed, there's nothing you're going to do in the lake that's going to fix it permanently or even semi-permanently. You have to deal with the watershed. Well, on the other hand, if you're living in Mexico City, which is the picture on the right, how are they ever going to fix that watershed so that it doesn't have any impacts on that lake, which is in fact a drinking water supply. It's not going to be easy. So you do need a lot of in-lake methods. Um, I think it comes up later, but the analogy I use is a leaking boat. You know, if you have leaks in your boat, you need to patch it. But if the boat's already full of water, you're gonna have to bail out the water to make it useful. So a lot of the methods I deal with are the in-lake part, but the watershed management is job one. Now I'm showing the Northeastern US here with phosphorus regions. The blue is low and the yellow is high. There's quite a range here, a big range. So if you happen to live in Western New York, out on the left side of that graph, uh, you know, it's a whole lot different than living in Northern Maine. Um, and it just is, it's, it's not created equal. This is a problem of our regulatory systems. We try to make the level playing field, the same regulations apply to all. It doesn't really work in environmental management. Everything's got its own predisposition that you have to work with. But you do have to manage the watershed if you want the best long-term conditions. And watershed management, which could be an entire course. In fact, I have taught an, taught an entire course on this. Um, source controls and pollutant trapping is what it boils down to. You control the sources, that's great. I don't know how you do that in an urban environment. 
uh, pollutant trapping is just catching them so they don't wind up in your water. There's millions of like, a lot of techniques that you can use here, none of which is perfect, none of which is a catch-all, but all of which can help. Okay, this gets back to what I was saying before. You know, developed land is going to bump up the loading of a lot of things, including nutrients, by like an order of magnitude. All of our best management practices tend to cut things in half or not even. So if you move, if you increase your loading by tenfold and then you cut it in half, you're still up fivefold. It's a losing, it's not a zero sum game, it's a losing game. The agricultural impacts are at least as great as urban impacts. So this is, it's a real issue. If we want to have food and we want to live somewhere, we're going to have impact on water quality. Um, if you have more than about 20% of the watershed developed, you've got a problem. If you've got more than 30%, you do have a problem. So it's not like it has to be completely built out. Um, watershed management protects lakes. It doesn't usually suffice for rehabilitating them. And the picture on the left there, you know, the land on the far left is very different than the land on the right. And the land on the right cannot be made to behave like it's the land on the left. There is not enough money to do that. It just is not possible. Um, and on the, what, the picture on the right overall, you know, again, the boat's full of water, plugging the leak isn't gonna fix the problem. You may need to plug that leak to ultimately fix the problem, but it's not gonna be enough by itself. So while watershed management is job one, it's not the end of the job in hardly any cases, unless you don't have a problem. And getting people to manage their watersheds when they don't have a problem in the lake is really hard to do. All right, so the data needs that you, you have when you're dealing with in-lake management, and the algal types and, and the quantity and the quality, you need to understand what you've got out there. It's just like if somebody comes and I have a rooted plant problem, well, which rooted plant is it? It's the same thing with algae. You can't just have an algae problem. We need to know more than that. Uh, the water quality is essential. Inflow and outflow sources and amounts, your whole water budget. Um, the bathymetry of the lake is critical to a lot of the management methods. The sediment features, the zooplankton, the fish communities matter, and the vascular plants matter. Now, you don't have to know every last detail about every one of those, but you need to know something about them, depending upon the management technique, to do it as best you can. All right, so I'm going to work first with things that increase the loss of algae. So I'm starting with an easy one, harvesting. Not really feasible in most areas. You're not going to pick up plankton with a harvester, but you could pick up algal mats. In fact, the Chicago Botanical Garden has several harvesters, not this one pictured, but they're smaller versions with more like a, a grocery market checkout conveyor on it that actually brings the algae up and lets it slide off and dump in a hopper because it's a highly fertilized environment. They're going to have algal mats and they don't want the people looking at them. So they go around early in the morning and they scoop up the mats. It's a doable thing. It's not going to get rid of your problem. Uh, it's maintenance. But yeah, you can do things like that. Uh, flushing. Uh, this has actually been, I don't want to say popular. It's, it's if you have a source of water and you can keep the water flushing through the system at least once every three weeks, preferably more like every two weeks, um, you can actually prevent algal blooms because they're, as fast as they can come up or generate, they get washed out. Now, the main picture in the bottom, there's Moses Lake. Gene Welch wrote a paper about that back a ways. They actually used the Columbia River to flush this lake. I mean, that's a pretty big scale thing. I have a couple small ones where I've done that. We're in an isolated pond next to a substantial size creek or river, and we were set it up so we could divert flow through and flush it out. It works. It's not really fixing the true problem, but it can get rid of the symptoms with your algal blooms. And the reason you got a picture of a hydrant up there on the left is that we have the Clean Water Act. Uh, you know, which governs a lot of lake things. We also have the Safe Drinking Water Act, which requires us to provide safe drinking water to people. And those two can conflict. Um, if you have pipes where they're concerned about corrosion, they have to put additives in to basically keep lead and copper and things from coming out of the pipe. The most popular additive used is a phosphate. So we have eutrophic drinking water. You can have literally a milligram per liter in that water. So using public water, a public water supply that's been treated that way to flush a lake or somehow supposedly dilute a lake, not gonna work. You're actually putting in more phosphorus. And no matter what you do, even if you have really clean water, if it's got any phosphorus at all, you're increasing the phosphorus load. You may be decreasing the average concentration. 
there's a fundamental limitation to this. Flushing works if you can move the water through fast enough. If you have a six month detention time and you're gonna cut it to three months, it's not gonna work. You gotta get down to every few weeks. And that's pretty hard to do unless you've got a small lake and a big water source. All right, sonication. Um, this has gained a lot of traction in recent years. And I actually do look at algae samples for one of the companies that sells these things. Again, I don't work for them. I have no vested in interest in the technology. I, they just have clients send me samples. They tell them what's in it, then they decide if they think it's going to work or not. What you typically see in product literature are the pictures on the bottom there, the horrible scum, and now we can make it look like this. Well, that's not what you want to do. You want it to look like on the right when you start and never get to the point where it's on the left, because if you kill it all on the left, you're going to have a big stinking mess and potentially a lot of toxins released and so on. Um, there's a couple different brands. They can be just unidirectional, like the one on the left there. They can have units aimed in multiple directions like the one in the middle. They can be really fancy with solar arrays. They can uh, change the frequency of sound that's being emitted. There's a lot they can do. And sonication is a standard lab technique for disrupting cells. People asked questions earlier about avoiding the aggregations. You could use sonication to smooth that out and bust things up more. It may make your identification harder, but you can do it. Uh, well, you can do the same thing in the environment. Now, they have not found that it has major impacts on zooplankton or fish, but then fish are pretty sensitive on their lateral lines for detecting vibrations. I would think that might have an effect, but I've never seen a bunch of dead fish or loss of zooplankton because of a sonic unit. And it does work if you get the right frequency with the right type of algae to cause the interior cell part to separate from the outer cell wall and the cells do die. They don't necessarily rupture, they just tend to fall out settle down, it works very well in buoyant blue greens, it'll make those things settle. So it's not, uh, it's not snake oil, it's a real technique. The catch is, you, it's like a flashlight, it's a line of sight technology. You have to be able to get the algae in the beam. And it's not like it's this incredibly wide beam or some of these are set up to be 360 degrees and how far out does it work? That's not really known. It's not like it's gonna go through vegetation or a wall or anything else or around a corner. Um, it has physical limitations on the area it can act upon. Uh, it is pretty effective on blue-greens, uh, not as effective on diatoms or greens, which maybe is a good thing. Although I have seen it work really well on green algal mats before they form. Once a green algal mats formed, there's almost nothing you can do that's gonna be very uh, desirable, but you can prevent them from forming. Uh, that will work, I think, is that? No, it's not the next picture. I have one where I'd show the, the clean substrate and the not clean substrate, and the difference was having a sonic unit in there. So it's very popular, say, in a water supply intake area where they want to knock stuff out of the plankton. It's a controlled smaller area, and they want to keep stuff from growing on the walls of the intake and things like that. Makes perfect sense. To put a forest of these out in the lake to keep the blooms down, eh, I don't know about that. Um, but if I was in a golf course pond, um, a waterfowl pond at a zoo where I know I'm going to have nutrients, well, increasing the loss process this way is a legitimate way to go. Hey, Ken, quick question. Yep. Um, one of the questions was how large of an area, pretty much small pond line of sight, right? Yeah, and it, the actual area controlled is gonna depend on the density of algae, whether or not there's any plants in the way. Um, they'll tell you five, 20, 30 acres, but I don't think there's a real size, not that you can buy one, and say, okay, this is gonna work for this many acres in my pond. I have a pond where they use this pretty successfully. It's a one acre pond, but it's very amoeboid shaped. It's not a real, not a natural pond. It was designed by a landscape architect and all landscape architects think ponds look like amoeba. <laughs> uh, it took five units at three grand a unit to make it work. And what percent improvement in water clarity do you generally get? Well, it's not improving water quality, it's killing algae. Clarity. It's not going to change the phosphorus concentration. It may release toxins if they were present when you started. It's not a water quality improvement. It's right. an Clar algae killing device. Right. Clarity. Oh, clarity. Um, clarity. Yeah. It can be pretty well. If, if it works, there's just no algae in the water, minimal algae in the water. So I, I would like in the one that I've studied directly, it made the water quite clear. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it was pea soup. Uh, pea soup's not the right word. Less than a meter visibility. It was actually mostly green algae in that one. Uh, and you could see to the bottom in 12, 15 feet when, when they were done. So it can work. You know, again, the flow through matters too. 
A lot of these get put in treatment plants or places, a finishing step, and it's a matter of how fast the water goes through. So again, these are not easy questions. They're not a standard number that goes, but also size of the unit, placement of the unit, there's a whole lot that figures into it. Okay? All right, um, algicides. Now there's relatively few active ingredients available. By far the most two common you'll see are copper and peroxide. Um, they both can work. There is some use of some of the uh, regular uh, higher plant herbicides as algicides. Endothol is one, flumioxazin is another. Flumioxazin is the active ingredient of clipper, if you've heard of that herbicide. It seems to be one of the best things for getting filamentous green algae, because not much does. Uh, the effectiveness and the longevity are really important considerations. Again, we're working on loss. That's all we're doing. We're killing algae here. We're getting them out of the system. Okay, copper gives you rapid results, matter of hours. It does affect most cyanobacteria, but occasionally there's some resistant strains. There's some phanazominans it won't do anything to. And some of the ones with really heavy gelatinous sheets, it doesn't do as well on. Um, it can lyse the cell, but it doesn't have to. In that case, it's gonna release the toxins into the water, which is gonna be an issue if you've got a lot of them. As a result, a number of states have thresholds for cells per milliliter above which they won't let you treat because they don't want all this stuff dumped into the water at once. Now you could have a nice philosophical and regulatory conversation about, well, it's gonna get released eventually anyway. Um, and, but bottom line is that you really don't want to lyse cells if you can avoid it. Now there are some formulations and keep in mind, not all copper is created equal. There's a whole bunch of formulations. They don't all act the same. Copper is the active ingredient, but it's only one aspect of the algicide. Um, there are ones that will actually tend to make stuff settle out first before they die. And there may be some advantage to that. Uh, that formulation affects how long it's in solution and how effective it'll be against different types of algae. There is possible toxicity to other aquatic organisms. If you apply copper at the label rate in, in the United States, you could kill fish. You could certainly kill zooplankton. But the reality is at least where I live in the Northeast, we hardly ever use more than a 10th of a milligram per liter. I've never seen anything else die as a result. But you could use a whole milligram per liter in the Midwest. And if you have turbid water, you may need it, but you may kill something else in the process. So there's trade-offs to be had. But it's not like when you put copper in immediately, you're killing everything. I've heard people say, well, I just don't think you should put copper in because it's a toxin. You say, well, okay, would you rather have a whole bunch of blue-green toxins floating around? I mean, it's a choice to be made here. Uh, there is no win-win-win in lake management that I'm aware of. There is always a trade-off. Um, the long-term buildup in sediment's been a concern. There's never been any proven major negative impact. It can't be a good thing. If nothing else, the copper builds up, you're going to have permitting problems if you ever want to dredge it, because now you have to get rid of copper-laden sediment, and there are limits to that. But we've never found that the copper stays active down there, that it now kills the invertebrates or does anything else. Um, not that it couldn't, but nobody's ever proven it. Um, again, usually you apply this stuff to the surface and most of the label stuff has you putting in a dose that treats the upper 10 feet. Of course, if you've got a thermocline bloom, that's not helping. Um, I have a project in Connecticut where we realized that the contributing area was the sediment in a donut somewhere between 10 and 15 foot deep and 30 foot deep. So we literally treat a donut around the lake with weighted hoses and chilled solution that gets right down to the bottom and kills the stuff on the bottom before it ever pops up. Pretty clever, but a lot more work than people are willing to go to in many cases. Peroxide can also lyse cells. It tends to be more effective on thin walled forms, so that is the cyanobacteria, also less so on diatoms and uh, greens. It degrades to non toxic components. There's nothing left at the end that's going to contaminate your sediment. It may actually oxidize some toxins depending upon the dose. So there's some extra potential benefits there. Uh, also applied to the surface in most cases, but you can use a pelletized formula, you can actually get it down deeper. Uh, it is more expensive than copper, but the dose and the frequency of use need to be considered. I know folks in Connecticut at a water supply that use this, and they find that the duration of benefits done sparingly early in the season has enabled them to use peroxide at a level that is not way more expensive than copper. So again, it's a lot to be known in how you're doing it. I cannot give you the whole course on how to be an applicator of this stuff right here. Um, it is not a simple matter of buying something thrown in the water. 
Okay, I'm gonna give you an example of one of my projects that here's how we used copper to minimize bloom problems for three years while they build up a war chest to do an aluminum treatment, which will come up later. Um, as you can see here, we, we have a, a, if I do this, does my cursor show okay? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great, okay. So here, you know, you've got 3000 micrograms per liter sort of, I, I call it yellow instead of a red line because it depends on what the algae are, whether or not that's a problem, but that's a fair amount of algal biomass. But here, and they used to have horrible blue-green blooms, way worse than this one over here. What we did was as soon as it got over that 3000 mark, uh, and we saw the, any blue-greens at all showing up, they treated. So that was in late June. And it knocked it down. We had some blue-greens, but they got all the way through the rest of 2017, no problem. Here's 2018, we start seeing the blue-greens go, should have been treated right there. But it wasn't at 3000, so they said, ah, we can wait a week or two or three. Well, now they've got a bloom going. So they treated, it knocked it down, but it never knocks it all down. And the label for copper, all copper products, is no more than half the lake at once. So you've got half the lake you're not touching. And in fact, it came back again later on in the summer and they had to do it again. And then they got through that with, and they 2019, same deal. As soon as it showed up, said, don't mess around, hit it. Because this stuff was coming up off the bottom and they were floating up to the top. It was all uh, big delicious spermums like Lemmermanii. So they treated again and they did okay through that year. Now we come into here and we actually did the aluminum treatment. And now all the way out through here, we're not having that problem anymore. The blue greens are pretty well knocked out. Different technique, but the point is you can do it, but you've got to stay on it. You make a mistake, you're going to have a bloom. All right, barley straw. This has been popular. It, it gets a lot of play. The bottom line is it is an unlicensed algicide, unregistered. So a certified licensed applicator can't put this in for you because it's not an approved chemical, if you will. But it can work. Steve McComas, that's him in both those pictures from Minnesota, is kind of the guy that, that not pioneered, but did a lot of practical work with this. And his conclusion summed up nicely is it works sometimes. I'm not sure why, and you can't count on it. Uh, basically, you get allelopathic substances from the decay of barley straw that do seem to knock blue greens out pretty well. Uh, the bacterial activity that goes with it may compete for some nutrients. There's definitely been some limited success for it. it. It's just not a reliable technique. I can't tell you that it's gonna work. I can't tell you what dose to use. There's a lot of tricks to it that I don't think we thoroughly understand because it's not registered algicide. Can't really use it in a professional way. Uh, viral controls, very popular in the seventies, came back in the early 2000s. There is no commercial product I'm aware of that you can buy that does this. And I think a lot of it has to do with this. If you start out with what it looks like that, and after treating, it looks like that, are you really any happier? You're going to go swimming in that? I mean, it, it doesn't tend to get them all. Um, but the theory was sound. Biomanipulation. I, I love this stuff. This is I didn't do my PhD thesis, but I supported myself doing a biomanipulation project that funded my PhD work. Basically, if you have big indiscriminate filter feeders like Daphnia, they're going to filter that water every day. A dozen of them in a liter of water will move the whole volume of water. Now, if you've got a lot of big blue-green particles in there, those big delicious spermums, a microcystis colony, they can't really eat them. A glia tricky, they can give it a haircut, but they can't eat the whole thing. So it's not gonna really be effective in that case. And that's why when you have elevated phosphorus, this tends not to work out. But if you have a nice assemblage, nice meaning lots of little things, less than 50 micron particle sizes that they can consume, they can clear that water every day. Now you're getting high productivity, but not a lot of biomass buildup. This is the holy grail of, of lake management in my mind, because we want algae being produced. We want zooplankton eating. We want little fish eating those zooplankton. We want big fish eating those little fish. And I want to catch the big fish. Um, it, it works great, but like anything in biology, it's a jigsaw puzzle where the parts keep take changing shape. You can't get it to do exactly what you want every season, every year. Um, but yeah, if you alter your fish community so it favors the zooplankton of bigger size, um, you will get a certain amount of grazing capacity. Now, what I'm showing you here is actually the subject of my talk yesterday about the impact of alewife. Other planktivores can do something similar, they're not as severe as alewife. 
the more daphnia biomass I have, the higher the clarity in these lakes. Now, these are all lakes that were treated with aluminum, so they have fairly low phosphorus. Again, if I had really high phosphorus, it probably wouldn't work. But where I have lower phosphorus and I don't have blue-green blooms and I have a nice assemblage of edible forms, having more daphnia will give me much clearer water. And it works. Um, it's the icing on the cake. It's not the cake itself. You have to control the nutrients first. Okay, now we're gonna switch over to growth control. These are the things that you do to keep the algae from becoming a problem. Overall, I would say this is preferable, except you have to be realistic. There are golf courses and wildlife ponds that are going to be fertile. There are urban lakes that are always going to have nutrients coming into them. There are situations where we're what fish, fish is the primary reason to be a fish farm, an agricultural operation, or simply a well-regarded fishing lake, where you're not trying to reduce the overall fertility. But in general, if you want to control algae, controlling the growth in the first place is kind of where you want to be. You can do this within your lake if you can't do it in the watershed. This look, the scale here looks a little screwy. This is actually a three, three and a half acre pond. This is a few hundred square foot of in bay where a big storm drain comes in, where we created a wetland, so we created our own little detention basin. And the whole rest of the lake, 3.3 acres worth or whatever is out here. The water came in here at 200 micrograms per liter of phosphorus and went out at 20. 20 is still a little higher than I like, but not bad, 90% reduction. Um, you can do this. Way better to apply the source controls or the trapping much closer to the source, but yeah, you can do this. Selective withdrawal. Um, also a hot topic uh, way back, went away for a while, gotten popular again. Gertrude Nuremberg's done a lot with this. Um, Al Sosiak, the NOMS, just wrote a paper that isn't quite out in print yet, but looking at 25 years of data for selective withdrawals. I have two lakes where selective withdrawal was applied, and both of them helped that lake clean up and achieve a much cleaner condition after 25 years. It's, it doesn't happen fast. What you're really doing is pulling the poor quality water out of the bottom and getting it out your outlet before it becomes a problem for the whole lake. If you can do it in a small, highly flush lake, maybe one that isn't even stratified, you can keep the water from ever going anoxic at the bottom and becoming poor quality water, and that's a home run. If on the other hand, you're discharging the water that is poor quality, low oxygen, high phosphorus, you're now sending that downstream. You may have a regulatory or at least a philosophical issue with that. Uh, so this has limitations of where you can use it. But where there aren't those limitations, it, it has been an aid to improving the lake, but it doesn't happen quick. Dye addition, it's another one that seems sort of hokey, but you know, if I'm Rockefeller Center or this uh, Florida development with a stormwater pond, yeah, okay, it, it can work. Uh, it basically inhibits light. It's not an algicide, although it gets treated by one in permitting situations. It may cause stratification in a shallow lake because you're now going to absorb a lot more sun heat in the very surface and you're going to get temperature differential. And once that's more than about three centigrade degrees, there's not going to be any mixing going on. So you could have a five foot deep lake that has a two to three foot epilimnion and a two to three foot hypolimnion. It's a little weird. Um, and it won't prevent all growth, but the color tends to make it a little more appealing. Um, I once had a small lake for a very, very wealthy person uh, that they built the lake but they weren't happy with the colors. So we could put dye in there. And the woman said, well, I like to swim in it. What we'll do, so it'll turn you into a smurf. She was like, but you're gonna have a heart attack, but that isn't actually true. It doesn't, doesn't get on your skin too much. Um, but again, it's, it's a maintenance measure. Dredging, this is pretty extreme, but if you're dredge a lake and remove the sediment and the internal recycling is your primary problem, your primary source of phosphorus and nutrients in that lake, makes a huge difference. Now, I don't know anybody who dredges a lake just to get rid of the nutrients because of algae problems. It's so expensive and so hard to do from a regulatory perspective. But if you were going to do a dredging project, you would get huge benefit out of it if internal recycling is your primary issue. Obviously, if you've got a big urban watershed, it's probably gonna make no difference at all. Uh, well, that isn't always true. One of the exceptions is mats. Let's see, do I have it on the next one? No. Okay, I, I trimmed this down a bit, and, and so we're missing a few slides that might be more illustrative. But 
Um, if you have algal mat problems and you take out that bottom, you're taking out now the, the seeds or you know, the spores and such, the resting stages, you're taking out the mass of algae itself, you're taking out the sediment they were living on. I have seen them get multiple decades out of a dredging project in terms of mat control. Um, in terms of phytoplankton, that's going to matter what's coming from the watershed and what's in the upper water column. And it may make a difference for that. But I don't know that I'd go to the expense of dredging with its ecologically disruptive nature and expense and permitting problems when it has no effect on watershed inputs just to improve the algal conditions. Okay, phosphorus inactivation. Somebody already asked a question about this. This one, I mean, you know, I don't really have a conflict of interest here because I don't do any of these things. I just um, evaluate lakes and make recommendations. I'd like to tell people I don't do any real work. I just talk about it. Uh, but this one's pretty near and dear to my heart. If there's any technique I'm most associated with, it's this because man, it works. It's so flexible to use it. Philosophically, there's some issues here, but boy, you can really do a job in a lake if you've got the ability to inactivate phosphorus. Um, you know, you'll have people arguing that nitrogen is really important, and it's a the beer commercial, less filling taste great. Of course, nitrogen's important, but nitrogen tends to determine what's growing there. Phosphorus tends to determine how much. Um, so if you want to do an inactivation project, there's three different things you could be doing. You could be dosing the inlet, like over here, and cleaning up stormwater going in. You could be doing a low dose treatment in the lake itself, uh, just to strip phosphorus out of the water column for a long detention time lake, you can buy some time. Or in most cases, we're trying to inactivate accumulated phosphorus in the sediment that's being released because it's bound to iron and there's low oxygen down there and the iron and the phosphorus dissociate and go up in the water column. And that phosphorus can become available to algae. So those are the three methods that we're usually using. Um, again, if you're gonna do one, you need to understand the phosphorus load. You need to know what's internal and what's external. If the internal load is more than a quarter of the total, it may make sense. Phosphorus inactivation may make a big difference. If it's more than half the total, you're gonna to have to deal with it. If that's the leaking boat, with the boats full of water, you know, you, you can't fix it if you don't deal with the in-lake portion if it's more than half your total load. Keep in mind in the year, stuff comes in all year round, but internal loading is really focused on the summer months. Now that's a little less true in Florida, and it may be true in some lakes with heavy ice cover where you also get anoxia at the bottom. For the most part, the phosphorus loading from internal sources is focused on the growing season, and mainly the summer, which is when our problems are. So it's disproportionately more important than runoff that happens year round. Uh, you need to know the types of available sediment phosphorus. There's specific testing you do for that. It's not just a total phosphorus measurement. Uh, the system bathymetry and hydrology are real important. Water chemistry alteration, you can change the pH. You may be altering metals levels. Uh, the oxygen concentration matters. There's a whole lot of things to think about in this. Potentially sensitive receptors, that's Everything from the fish, the zooplankton, the invertebrates, the reptiles, the amphibians, the waterfowl, the whole routine. If you've got endangered species in there and aluminum for one thing can be toxic, there may be some issues. Uh, accumulated residues, that turns out to be less of an issue than you'd think. Uh, most places I've seen have never had a buildup problem with, with uh, inactivation residue. Okay, some examples. I mentioned the uh, water column treatments. Again, iron's the most common natural binder, but it doesn't hold phosphorus under anoxic conditions. Aluminum is the most commonly applied binder. There's multiple forms of it. It gives you fairly permanent results. There are toxicity issues if it's not properly applied. You gotta keep the pH within a zone of about six to eight. I prefer a little higher than six to seven and a half. Uh, you could use calcium in a high pH system, but that's gonna resolubilize. Uh, there can be some loss of phosphorus off of aluminum at really high pHs, but it's not common. Uh, lanthanum has been more recently done. That's the active ingredient in phospholock that was brought up. Uh, and you know, use this for water column or sediment phosphorus inactivation. What I'm showing you below is a lake in Connecticut, Wood Pond, uh, which was treated with a low dose, uh, typically around two milligrams per liter once or twice a summer. Here, prior to treatment, you can see ridiculous phosphorus levels. I mean, a couple hundred micrograms per liter. That's mostly coming out of the sediment, but it isn't really mostly iron-bound phosphorus. They don't have a serious oxygen problem. 
their real issue is organic matter decaying because this lake's only five foot deep and it was created out of a wetland. So it was predisposed to this problem to begin with. But once we started doing the treatments, you can see the phosphorus comes up, they knock it down, comes up again, they knock it down again. And over time, we're also inactivating the stuff in the sediment, although inactivating that organic matter is not a one-shot deal. Uh, but you can see that we have squashed the phosphorus down to a much lower level. Now that purplish line is sort of the target. As you can see, we don't meet it most of the time because we still have a ridiculously urban watershed pouring stuff into it. And we're only treating twice a summer. There's activity going on in terms of decay the whole summer long. But for a lake like this that doesn't have control over the watershed, and just wants to get some clearer water, this has worked really well. They can see the bottom most of the time because the bottom's only five feet down. Um, now I should add that they've had issues with rooted plants coming up, so they've used herbicides on them. And then the green algal mats started forming at the bottom and floating up. So it's aquatic whack-a-mole. Uh, I'm not saying this is an ideal situation by any means, but it can work. It's incredibly flexible. Okay, the more typical thing that we do is to try to hit the sediment on a one-time deal. You're trying to inactivate the phosphorus in this surficial layer of sediment, typically upper 10 centimeters, four inches, that's what you're shooting for. And you're trying to get rid of that material, the phosphorus in it, so that it can't come out and, and get into the water column. And if you dose it properly, it works really well. And because that internally loaded phosphorus and comes along with iron and some other things, tends to be very favorable to cyanobacteria, we tend to get rid of the blue-green blooms as a result. We were shifting the nitrogen phosphorus balance right away because these treatments have virtually no effect on nitrogen. The initial treatment might because they'll settle some stuff out of the water, but um, you're not really affecting the nitrogen level. So we're gonna get a much higher NP ratio, which is gonna shift you away from blue-greens. You're gonna get lower phosphorus overall, which tends to go with other things besides blue-greens. And here's what we had before treatment, we had pretty bad blue green blooms. This is long pond out in Cape Cod. After the treatment, we're now 14 years into it. Looks pretty darn good. It's not like there's never blue greens there. In fact, the blue green I most often see there is uh, Planktolingbia and Sudanabana late in the summer. They seem to grow around the thermocline and then pop up. So it's not perfect, but we don't have blooms. The clarity in this lake is typically four to six meters. And this is one of those alewife lakes I mentioned that has lower clarity than it would if it didn't have the alewife. So this one's done very well. And it's still got plenty of algae. It's still a great fishery. This has been a pretty big success story. Hey, Ken, um, yep. can you go back to that previous slide? We had a question about um, what was the treatment actually in this in this. That, that's phosphorus. It's um, aluminum. It's aluminum as well. This particular one, uh, the areas of the lake were zoned by the phosphorus concentration in the sediment, and they got as little as 10 grams per square meter and as high as 50 grams per square meter. The average treatment in New England is about 50 grams per square meter. So this is on the low end and did really well. Um, the treatments out west tend to be more. There were a couple of treatments reported on Shannon Radabo. I think Shannon's on this one. She reported on one that was, <laughs> it was, hundreds and hundreds of grams per square meter. That was like out of anything I've ever considered here. Uh, but you know, it's a matter of what you need in a particular circumstances and, and you know, can you do it or not? Uh, but yeah, this, is, this was a relatively low dose treatment. But again, this lake uh, has a real sandy bottom. Um, the sediment is not thick. The deepest sediment I ever found there was like eight inches. That's not much in a lake. It goes back to glacial time, but it's this big 740 acre lake with virtually no watershed, it's a kettle hole that's been sitting there all this time. Uh, and its real issue was it had a turkey farm and some cranberry bogs way back that are long gone. So, but anyway, again, this is, and I, I show you lots of, I do the phytoplankton, a lot of these things, and they all show the same thing for the most part. I have two that even though I thought the dose was right when we put it in, we still get blue greens in those two lakes. And of course the people that don't like chemicals being put in the water love to parade those out. But the reality is those two lakes are still way better than they were before we treated. They're just not as good as I hope they would be. All right, so the third way, this is really stuff that Harvey Harper pioneered in, in Florida. He did this for 20 years, I think, before anybody else thought of it. it. Basically, you can dose the tributaries coming in or dose a storm drain. So keying off of him, I created this system for an urban lake outside of Boston that didn't just have blue green problems, they had algae problems, period. You know, they had all the different types, all the groups, anything could bloom in this lake and often did. 
and it's a, next to their town wells. Um, it's where their you know multi million dollar swimming complex is. It it was not a good situation. So we put in this treatment system, and as you can see, we knocked it way down. After that, we still get the occasional bits of blue greens, and actually, the last two years are two of our worst in a while. It's funny. 2020, we only treat between Memorial Day and 4th of July. We're basically trying to clean up the water so you go into the summer in this lake in good shape. And it's usually dry enough in the summer that you make it through the whole summer with no problems. We had such a dry June in 2020 that we didn't get very much chemical in. And so we didn't have as much of an impact. This year, we had a relatively dry June, but I bumped it up and made sure we treated extra whenever we could. And we went to the end of June with spectacular conditions. It then started to rain on the urban watershed and rained for three straight weeks with only two days off. So we just got pounded by extra nutrients and sediment coming in, and we didn't do nearly as well this year. Now we're still way better than we were before. They were still able to swim in it. We didn't have any hazardous blooms, but yeah, okay, it's not perfect. We would have to treat all the time if we wanted to make it better. But it's a straightforward enough system and it's not terribly expensive. Okay, I'm gonna shift. To, oh, I didn't mention phospholock in there, and I should. Phospholock is similar to aluminum and it binds up phosphorus, but there are some differences. It's not a coagulant. So it's not going to pull particles out of the water. It's not gonna deal with total phosphorus. It deals with dissolved phosphorus. So if you put it in the water column, it strips things out. If it's dissolved phosphorus, it's not gonna deal with the algae and stuff that are already up there. So you really wanna use phospholock when conditions are already pretty good. So that tends to be a spring type thing or early spring. And if you've got a lake that's blooming all year long, you've got a problem. You may have to do it multiple times and work your way up to it. Um, it also is attached to bentonite clay, which is then going to coat the bottom. Now it's not a whole lot. It may just seep into it. But in theory, you're getting some separation between the organic matter, which causes oxygen demand and the water column. So that has a potential benefit to it. I've not seen anybody study it. I didn't see the manufacturer claim it, but it seems to me that if you did a good job with this, you might actually make some additional improvements. What lanthanum does that aluminum doesn't is it's pretty specific for phosphorus. They put that in, they're not expecting a lot of anything else to bind to those lanthanum ions. Whereas aluminum is gonna to bind to all sorts of things. The lower the phosphorus concentration, the less efficient the aluminum treatment. Lanthanum doesn't seem to care. So they're a little different. And actually people are using them both together. They call it flock and lock, use the aluminum to flocculate things and the lanthanum to bind it all up and lock it all in the sediment. So the answer to the question earlier, does it actually seal the sediments? Seal's a tough word. It's not like doing your driveway or something. It's not making it a hard packed surface that nothing can get through. And you're still gonna have potential anoxia that lets some stuff seep up like the iron, but it will stop the phosphorus from getting out and does a pretty darn good job of it. Now, to say that, in my own work, the best aluminum treatments have gotten a 90% reduction in phosphorus level. If you look across the whole range of treatments, the claim is you get 60, 65% reduction. That's still pretty darn good for the cost compared to anything else. All right. Oxygenation circulation. Again, this could be an entire course. There were several really good talks on that at the conference. Uh, oxygenation and circulation are different things. Circulation will oxygenate. Oxygenation does not have to circulate. And I'm just showing a bunch of the different options here out of a manual I wrote, just, you know, different ways you can move water up and down or get air in or out. Uh, they're all different. Claiming you're oxygenating, you're circulating is not a good enough state and you need more detail. So, all right, the black line things are what oxygenation and circulation do. The red is what circulation can do for you additionally. So that may make you think right away, oh, circulation is better than oxygenation, you know, more, more options here. Well, not necessarily. Uh, you want to add oxygen, you want to facilitate phosphorus binding, and you want to minimize release from the sediment. You want to alter the pH to be favorable, keep it somewhere in the middle, not let it get out of whack, because when you get algae blooms, it can get really high. They, they photosynthesize and remove carbon dioxide that raises the pH. Uh, you want to create a zooplankton refuge, because I've already explained, that enhanced grazing can help you. Now, if you're mixing the system, the turbulence will also neutralize the advantage that's conveyed by the buoyancy mechanism for sun cyanobacteria. And I have seen this work. I've also seen it fail. It depends on how buoyant they are and how much buoyancy 
compensation you can generate with your circulation system. Homogenization yields more consistent water quality. If you're a water supplier, you will settle for a lower average water quality that's consistent because you can treat that regularly. It minimizes your headaches in your treatment system. It's worth doing. You want the best quality water you can get, but you don't want variability. So circulation can be very good in that regard. Okay, if you want to do it by non-destratifying oxygenation, there's really four ways to do this. And I often boil it down to three, but you can bubble pure dissolved oxygen into the water. If you have at least a six meter, 20 foot vertical run, most of those bubbles will have dissolved into the water before they reach the thermocline and cause circulation. So you can do this. Mark Mobley, Mobley Engineering, is the master of this. He does it all over the country. He's got some wonderful systems out there. It works very well. Requires a lot of modeling to do well. Jim Ruane's done a lot of that, uh, but this is a really solid technique. But the vast majority of lakes that I work with don't have 20 foot of vertical runtime. So you gotta find another way. The oldest way they used to do it are these hypolimetic aeration chambers where they would put a chamber in the lake, pull the water in, bubble air through it, let the air transfer some oxygen to the water and then feed it down an outside sleeve back where it came from. So you're using most of the height of the lake to do the oxygenation, but you're keeping it in a chamber thing. This can be effective, it's not efficient. You only get less than a 3% transfer of oxygen from the air bubbles for every meter that you rise. And the biggest containers are maybe 10 meters. So that's 30% transfer, the best you're gonna get. And air is only 21% oxygen. So you gotta do a lot of pumping to make this work. Um, it has worked, but they don't do this very much anymore. Instead, what they figure is working with pure oxygen was better. So you get things like the downdraft bubble contact or more simply a spies cone, Richard Spies was the inventor, where you put this down in the bottom of the lake, it's already under pressure. Now you pump in the water and you pump in the oxygen and the bubbles wanna go up and the water wants to go down and the two of them merge. And if you do it right, you get well oxygenated water going out some sort of header into your lake. These have been pretty good. The problem is you now have this big important apparatus on the bottom of your lake. How do you maintain it? So you gotta be able to bring it up. You gotta be able to go down there as a diver. Sometimes you have to burp the system because it gets extra gas buildup and it has to sit on some sort of hard pad. A lot of lakes have very mucky bottoms that doesn't work. So this is expensive, but it's doable. It, it's been successful in places. Alex Horn has a six paper series on doing this in Comanche Reservoir, hugely successful. Um, the last is side stream supersaturation, which is actually a really old approach but it really wasn't very effective until recently. And now it seems to be work much better. Um, you basically pull the water out of the lake from the bottom, oxygenate it to a super saturated condition in a container on land and put it back. Now the problem was when they originally did this, that it would heat up and they put it back and then it would float. It would cause the lake to destratify and oftentimes with disastrous consequences. They've sort of mastered this now. Paul Ganser is kind of the master of this one. Um, and they, they've got these going. I have one working now on the Cape. It didn't work great this summer because we had a lot of equipment issues. They, they used hose materials that were subject to some problems because you are using high oxygenation water and oxygen beats the heck out of equipment. It's a very reactive chemical. So, but they're getting there. The proof of concept is clear. When this thing was running right, the oxygen was wonderful in the lake. Nano bubbles have been sort of the hot, sexy thing lately. I will tell you, I have tried it without success in a stratified lake. They seem to work pretty well in shallower systems. All they're doing is creating such fine bubbles that the bubbles don't want to rise. So the oxygen stays in the system. Seems to be very applicable in wastewater. No reason it couldn't work in a lake, um, but we've not had the greatest success yet. I'm going to say it's not quite ready for prime time in lakes, but they're working on it. Hey, Ken, SSS Ken. is side stream saturation, right? Say again. Oh, yeah, yes, side stream saturation, right. Yep, that's what that stands for. And all that means is side stream you're pulling out and you're saturating, actually super saturating it with oxygen. So it's really side stream super saturation system. It could have been five S's. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you're gonna oxygenate, you gotta add enough oxygen to counter the demand in the lake, which means you need to measure the demand, which is not an easy thing. You can make measurements in the spring while the oxygen is declining and make an estimate from that. But as it warms up, the uh, decomposition accelerates and the oxygen demand increases, so you have to multiply. 
Uh, you can use chambers in a lab or in, in the lake to do it. Um, George Knockline's working on a system where you're looking at carbon, dissolved carbon changes that indicate redox potential and give you an idea of demand. So there, there's some good ways to go about it. Once you get it, you still have to bump it up because you're going to cause the water to move. Like if you put oxygen in as a gas, it's going to bubble. The bubbles move water. If you put water in that's oxygenated, you're moving it through the system. If you think about it like a swimming pool with a whole bunch of ping pong balls floating around, and I give you one minute to collect them, you'll get a bunch. But if I give you one minute and I give you a net and the water's moving around, you'll collect a whole lot more as it goes by you. It just it increases the demand because of the movement. So you need about 50% more, maybe even twice as much if you're using pure oxygen and five times as much or more if you're using air. So pure oxygen has gotten to be pretty popular. Um, there's pure dissolved oxygen systems. There's not any mechanical, there's no um, power cost because the oxygen will vaporize and go down the hose under its own power. You just need power for your controls. So the other ones require some pumping. So there is a cost there. But this has great potential to be a, I don't call it low cost, but at least a, an affordable approach under the right circumstances. Now you got to maintain the oxygen suitable for your target aquatic fauna if that's what you're doing it for. If you're just trying to improve water clarity or water quality overall, two milligrams per liter is enough at the bottom. Five milligrams per liter if you really want a good biota. You have to have enough phosphorus binder around to bind up that phosphorus. There are lakes where it's been going on for so long that sulfide is preferentially bound up iron and there isn't enough binder there to bind up the phosphorus if you put the oxygen in. So there is, and that's been known for three decades plus. A guy named Gaichter published a paper on that in the eighties saying that, hey, guess what? This doesn't work if you don't have P binders. And those of us doing some more, duh. But apparently people didn't realize this. Um, if you don't want to break stratification, then these sorts of oxygenation systems are, are a good way to go. Now, you can destratify, and there's three basic ways to do that. You can use a pneumatic system where you put air in the bottom, just like a bubbler in your aquarium or whatever, and it moves the water and circulates things. And that's a tried and proven methodology. Uh, there's many companies out there that do it. Uh, Vertex is one that, that makes some really good stuff. Air Max is another. People are out there, they, you know, they, this is a thoroughly workable thing. Otterbein does stuff that there's plenty of good companies out there that understand air-driven circulation. Um, again, it's not especially efficient in a shallow lake. You've got to have a lot of diffuser points to get everything moving because you don't usually get mixing more than seven to 10 times the width of whatever the height is. So you get a 10 foot deep lake. It's not going to do more than a hundred foot area in a circle, so you need a bunch of these. If you have a deep lake though, you could certainly break up stratification or keep it from stratifying. Um, the downdraft pump, that's the Resmic system out of Australia. You, you see the scale, there's a person down there. They're pulling water in the top and pushing it to the bottom. Um, this is what the guy talked about the other day. It was a, a talk, a company out in, in Illinois, same idea, just his is an American thing. And it does make perfect sense. You're taking oxygenated water with algae in it. You're pushing it to the bottom where you need the oxygen and there's no light. So the algae are gonna suffer. Makes a lot of sense, but you are mixing the whole lake. The alternative is the updraft pump. This happens to be a solar bee, which pulls the water up from wherever depth you put it and distributes it on the top. Now, if you look at the product literature, they show you, they show the water going all the way across the lake before it goes back down. Well, I guarantee you, if you pull cold water up from the bottom, it's not gonna go very far before it sinks. So you get a donut around these things that does it and they call it compensatory circulation out to the side that defies the laws of physics. Unless everything's perfectly evenly mixed at the same temperature, that never happens in the lake. A couple sunny days, that's over with. Uh, fountains are basically an updraft circulation thing. They don't do a whole lot of oxidating, but they're pretty and they do move water. So you know, there's some circulation benefit there. Okay, in circulation, you've got to move enough water to prevent a thermal gradient from setting up. You need a lot more energy to break stratification than to prevent it. Um, as the water warms, you need more energy. If I have a mass of water at 15 degrees centigrade, and I want to mix it with a mass of water at 20 degrees centigrade, it takes less energy to do that than mixing something at 20 centigrees, centigrade degrees with 25 centigrade. Same five degree differential, but the warmer water requires more energy to mix. So a general guide if you're using air, 
you need at least 1.3 cubic feet per meter per minute per acre that you're doing it. And you might need as much as two and really even more than that if it's a shallow system. If you're pumping the water, you need at least 20% of the target volume per day. Sometimes you need to move 100%. So the delivery of oxygen near the bottom is what you're going for, but you don't want to have sediment resuspension. So there's a big game going on there as to how close can I get this without causing things to get resuspended. Uh, and then you got to move the surface water to a depth of three times the secchi reading to get lower biomass. And there's the real rub. I mean, most of the lake may not be deeper than three times the secchi disk. You know, if I've got a 50 foot deep lake and my secchi disk is six meters, okay, I can make this work. But if I've got a 10 foot deep lake and my secchi disk is two meters, it's not gonna work. So it, 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 you, you can mix and you may change over the types of algae, but you're not necessarily gonna get less algae. And I've seen plenty of these systems create green water, just not blue greens. Um, maybe that's good enough. Uh, and if you do it and you have a good biological structure so that now the zooplankton can eat that algae, maybe it will clear up some. But the reality is circulation makes whatever nutrients are in there more available. So you gotta be sure that you're depressing the number of nutrients that are available. And that may take watershed management, it may take in lake inactivation, just mixing the water may not be enough. All right, moving on, um, rough fish removal. You know, if you take out the carp and the catfish, they do stir the bottom up. They do excrete and put nutrients back in the water. Uh, hard to do, hard, hard to really do it. There, there's actually was a talk or a vendor doing stuff with carp baits and such. And yeah, it works, um, but it's hard work. It's, it's not easy. And of course, it's, you know, Jurassic Park, nature finds a way. It's really hard to get rid of all of them. Rooted plant assembly. You know, if you've got a lake that's completely covered with plants, it probably won't have any algae problems. But then you'll have a plant problem. Uh, you know, duckweed covering over the whole lake. Somebody did talk about that. You know, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's not any better than having an algal bloom, I'm afraid. But uh, yeah, plants and algae, there is some competition there. Um, they, they don't necessarily go together. Of course, you could have a nice dense fringe of an invasive plant around the edge of your lake and still have a blue-green bloom in the middle. So it, it, they're not mutually exclusive, but it, it, it can help in some circumstances. Okay, a couple of them put in the undecided category. Uh, selective nutrient addition. Um, boy, I don't know if it was, might have been Frank Wilhelm. No, it was somebody else who talked about it. Uh, Louis Malat, he was talking about anoxia with iron and phosphorus and the importance to blue greens. He was pointing out if you put in a lot of nitrate, that gives an alternative oxygen source and will delay the onset of uh, low redox and release of iron and phosphorus. And that's absolutely true. But he was quick to say, I'm not espousing that as the method by which you get rid of your blue greens. It's, it's pretty unsatisfying to a lake manager say, I'm going to throw a bunch of extra nutrients in so that we can get rid of our algae problem. It doesn't, doesn't seem to work that way. But people way back worked with silica and more recently with nitrogen to shift the types of algae. Frank Wilhelm did a really cool experiment with Ted Harris, his grad student, um, in mesocosms in a lake where they added nitrogen or ammonia, I think it was actually ammonium nitrates, we're doing both, and they got it to move away from blue-greens in those mesocosms, even though it was blue-greens outside of them in the lake. And then they added zooplankton, the zooplankton ate the algae that were being produced, and they got clear water. Nice one-two punch. I'm not sure I'd try that out in a real lake. They do it in fertilization for fish production. Um, An increased silica always expands the diatom bloom. In fact, Bob Cortman, another NOMS guy, uh, likes to mix a lake before it fully stratifies to keep the diatoms going as long as possible into the summer. Then when finally that sort of fails and it starts stratifying its own, he switches over to hypolimetic oxygenation. So yeah, they're all things you can do. The biological structure is pretty darn important, but like I've said, it's the icing on the cake, it's not the cake itself. Bacterial additives, we could talk a long time for this. We don't have a lot of time on it. The problem with these is that most of them are proprietary ingredients, so they don't really tell you what they're doing. Uh, there's a lot of formulations and modes of action. There's a lot of simplistic claims. The one I like the best is the bacteria outcompeting the algae. And they show you this green vat and then a week later it's clear. I don't know anything microbial that outcompetes anything else in a week. Uh, you know, I think probably what's really happening is the enzymes they put in are acting like an algicide and killing the algae. And that's okay with me, but that's also an unregistered algicide. So they'll never make that claim. 
Um, there's variable results. I have seen big successes with this. I've also seen miserable failures. Um, it's not adequately scientifically documented. The very first paper I have ever seen go through peer review, looking at this stuff is in peer review now in Lake and Reservoir Management. We'll see if it makes it through. Um, it's a potentially effective, but not reliable method. And the way that the stream, Pat Sims Geiger, who's lake manager out in California, explained this, and I thought it was very well laid out. So I use his, you use an algicide to kill the algae. Don't claim you're out competing anything, kill the algae. Then use enzymes to break down the long chain hydrocarbons that represent the dead algae. Then you let some bacteria, whether you put them in, they're engineered, or whether they're already there naturally, metabolize those short chain hydrocarbons. And you may need extra oxygen to make that work. And then you use a settling agent to drop out all those particulates, including the bacteria, and you have a successful project. So you have four-step process going on here with at least three different additives. So if you can buy one product on the internet and throw it in, do you think that's really going to do the job? I don't. Okay, so the roll call for algal control, watershed management is always job one, but it's usually not the end of the job. Phosphorus and activation is incredibly flexible. Uh, useful technique. It can be done a bunch of different ways. I like it a lot. Oxygenation for a stratified lake with internal load dominant has tremendous benefits beyond just algae control. You're getting way better water clarity, way better habitat. There's a whole lot to be said for oxygenation. Circulation, preferably to three times the secchi depth in deep systems, where circulation maybe with inactivators, dyes, or bacterial additives in shallow systems. Dredging, where you want the total ecological overhaul and money and permits are no object. Algicides with proper timing and limited uses are, are a good thing to have in your back pocket. Um, you know, if you've got a water supply and you've got a bloom going on, you have people at risk. Treating that bloom with an algicide is probably the lesser of the evils. Uh, sonication, certainly if you can't control the nutrients and you have susceptible algae, it can work. Bio manipulation as that icing on the cake. I think it's a great thing to do in lakes. It usually leads to good conditions overall. The best conditions for promoting bio manipulation involve a lot of big game fish. Everybody's happy. And then other techniques as the scale of circumstances dictate. We don't throw away techniques. You know, who has not hit their thumb with the hammer? Do you throw the hammer away and put in your nails with a screwdriver? Not really. Learn to use the technique better. And we have a lot of techniques that are still being developed. And I believe that is it. Awesome. Okay, I got some questions for you. I answered some of them that were easy to answer, but some people had some more specifics. So okay. um, copper versus peroxide, are there differences in length of control? Um, yeah, well, the copper goes out of the system really fast. I mean, it's only in there for hours. Uh, the peroxide tends to hang around a bit longer. Also, the peroxide seems to do a more thorough job killing it. Now, again, there's a dose factor there. You know, if you don't do it right or you try to scrimp on it, it's, you know, but if you go by the label and do exactly what they've said, um, applicators have told me they think they get better results, at least with blue greens, with uh, the peroxide. On the other hand, copper is cheaper. Copper is effective and well-known. There's a bunch of different formulations. Uh, they've had very good results with it. Now, if you're just hammering this lake month after month with copper, you gotta step back and start looking for other options, start looking to control the growth processes and control the nutrients. But both of them have their place and neither of them is a bad product. It's a matter of, the, you know, a, copper doesn't kill fish people do. It's a matter of how you go about doing it. And um, how do you feel about uh, issues with concern over copper being upwardly mobile in the sediments? Issues with, Copper being upwardly mobile in the sediments that accumulates you know, in. Again, I, I've seen a little bit of that, but I, I have not seen much evidence of that at all. Yeah. Um, we used to be really know, concerned lots of stuff about moves that. Around, right. Lots of stuff can move around in the sediment. Phosphorus is very upwardly mobile if you create a gradient. I have not seen any documentation of that for copper. And again, once it's inactivated, once it's down there having reacted, it doesn't typically come back out of solution. Again, there's a paper of 50 years of copper treatment. Oh boy, Hanson and somebody or somebody in Hanson. It's gotta be 20 plus years old now. And they looked at this for 50 years and they couldn't find impact. Um, guy in New York, Jer Eric Paul, uh, did a research looking in New York at 
lakes that had copper treatments to see what impacts he can find. The answer was he couldn't find any. So, you know, it's not like it doesn't have impacts, but we've not found it to be some major, we haven't created a hazmat site by doing this anywhere that I know of. Um, there was a question about how long-term a control you can get with biomanipulation. Long-term control with? Biomanipulation. Oh, bio, so, well, that's the problem is that, you know, biology changes. You assume your fish community turns over completely once every five years. So the absolute best you could assume is five years, but nothing in biology is stable. I mean, let's yeah. say I put in a whole bunch of bass and they eat a whole bunch of little yellow perch. That we're eating the zooplankton, so now I have a lot more daphne and my water's getting clear. That's actually what I did in, in a particular lake and it was pretty cool. And then those bass spawn and made a whole bunch of really tiny bass the next year, which also eat zooplankton. So, you know, it goes up and down and, 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 and goes, Biological management of anything generally involves oscillation. The classic predator prey cycles, if you're not happy with the upper end of the oscillation, you're not going to be happy with the technique. Yeah. It's yeah. usually, again, icing on the cake, not the cake itself. Yeah, I kind of, I always, I'm like, yeah, you know, it can. It just uh, doesn't often work for a long, predictable period of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm rewriting the manual for Massachusetts now called the Practical Guide to Lake Management. And the environmental agencies are really pushing hard for me to put biomanipulation in the other category, the not really proven, because they've never really made it work for them. And I can show them success cases, but it's true. Nothing is stable or reliable when you're doing biological treatment. I mean, look at people that do it in wastewater. They're tearing their hair out all the time trying to balance things and work on things. It's, it's challenging. It's a lot harder than chemical or physical controls. Yeah. Um, how often do you have flocculation issues with alum? And, and when that happens, does it bring those blue greens back up to the water column? No, I, I not had, calc you said, said calculation issues? Um, flocculation issues. So oh, flocculation. having, yeah. No, it, it drops out really fast. I mean, usually you can't find any flock the next day in the water column. It, now, if you work on a windy day, it's just something's going to blow in shore, but it's not like you have piles of it on shore or anything like that. It's been very, very effective. Uh, you know, could you mess it up? Sure. Uh, but the, the, the doses we typically put in, which again, about 100 grams per square meter is the up, upper level. I've done 108 a couple of times, but it, you know, it's, we're not, we're not in the two, three, 400 that sometimes you see in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest. Um, I've not found it to be a problem. The stuff lays down. In fact, in Shannon's talk, I saw the bottom of that lake look like a lake I did at 108, where it's just the water's crystal clear. And it's got this bluish whitish bottom because it's all sitting there. But that flock will move into the sediment over a month or two, and it, you won't be able to tell it was ever there except that the water's crystal clear. And it congeals the sediment, so there's less stirring up of that sediment, too. Okay. But now the flock drops out really fast. And Foslock, same idea. I mean, the stuff could be in there for a few days, the clay particles and all, some of it's colloidal, but ultimately it drops out and the water clears. Is there a uh, minimum depth you want to use that with? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think the answer right now is no. We generally have worked in stratified lakes, but lately there have been several shallower lakes that have been done and they've all worked well. Um, you know, you hear people talk, well, what about a boating lake where we're going to stir all this stuff up? Well, I would refer you to Daniel Wayne's talk, looking at wakeboards, boats, and then everybody thought they were going to stir everything up, and she couldn't find any impact below two meters. So maybe if you've got a lot of big boats or serious wind problems in a lake that's two meters deep, yeah, maybe that's an issue. But, you know, you get 10, 15 foot of water depth, that stuff is not getting stirred up. Okay. And the last question was somebody had wanted to know how expensive SSS was compared to other aeration techniques. Yeah, um, I actually put that in the publication in 2015 for the American Water Works Group, the Water Research Foundation. Um, and I can't remember all the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but the pure oxygen diffusion amongst the non-destratifying oxygenation techniques, the pure oxygen diffusion is the least expensive at a couple thousand an acre capital cost and maybe like 10 bucks a kilogram of oxygen per year, you know, operational, uh, you roughly double that with the side stream supersaturation. A recent project where I costed it out, I thought they could do pure oxygen for about 
$35,000. It's a very small lake, 14 acre lake, but it's 45 foot deep. It's really unusual. Um, if they want to do side scene super saturation, I came up with 68,000. So about twice as much. Again, capital cost. Then you have to look at your ongoing operational cost. It's actually more expensive for anything that has pumping than it does for just the pure oxygen being loaded in. So it gets more expensive there. Again, none of this is cheap. None of this is, you know, do a couple bake sales and have a raffle for your lake association. You can afford this. That's why copper and peroxide get used so much. They're much cheaper. You know, that's why people deal with loss processes instead of reducing growth processes. But if you actually want to deal with the nutrients, it's not cheap. On the other hand, if you look at it per unit of mass of phosphorus that you're controlling, all these in-lake techniques are way cheaper than what it costs to do it in the watershed to get it out of there in the first place. So, Hundreds uh, of dollars per kilogram versus thousands of dollars. Of dollars, right. How deep did the boating disturbance um, affect the alum? How deep is the... How, so you were talking about having, you said the... Um, so the question was, how deep did the boating disturbance affect? This is from oh, Karen. Boat, boat, boats, this is a whole other topic that I, I really got into back in the 80s and the 90s. And now people think I'm the expert in it because nobody's been doing anything with it. But <laughs> uh, boats don't stir water down below about 15 feet. Uh, you know, if you've got some ocean going barge in there, maybe. But for the most part, the temperature differential at that point resists mixing. Your, your relative thermal resistance to mixing is high enough to avoid mixing for almost any watercraft below about 15 foot of depth. Now, again, Danielle Wayne's paper, she was looking at what they thought were some of the most serious mixing vessels out there, these wake boats, and she only got two meters. The disturbance wasn't measurable below that. And that doesn't surprise me. So what's a wake boat? Is it like a cigarette boat? No, it, well, no, it, it's a boat that takes on ballast. So it sits low in the water and it tips up and then they run a really heavy engine at a lo fairly low speed. And it creates this incredible wake up behind it that a person on uh, a tethered uh, paddle board or, or, or skis or whatever can literally surf on the wake. Oh. Well, they've gotten very popular at camps. And then if you want, they can go faster and you can water ski, but now you're water skiing in much rougher water. Oh. I have enough trouble when the water's calm. Like yeah. you know, I it, have no arm yeah, strength. It's, it's for the daredevils and it's apparently a lot of fun. And just like, you know, jet skis, I'm not a fan, but you ever see a jet skier who wasn't smiling? I mean, they like it. <laughs> they so, like it. But, yeah, yeah. But bottom line is most of these, they create shoreline waves that are an issue. And that's going to create erosion that may lead to algal problems. They create a lot of noise disturbance. There's all sorts of things wrong with it. But in terms of them stirring up the bottom, it is not nearly the issue that people have tried to make it out to be. Unless you're going into super shallow air areas that are... Oh, correct. And most yeah. lakes that have any kind of rational regulation have a no wake zone that's far enough out that you're not in shallow water. Yeah. If, if they enforce it. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So did anybody else have any questions? I don't see any. They want to unmute. Okay. I got to get out of this and unshare. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Trying. All right. So, Barry, you on? No, he You're can't get. Oh, I got the stop share. There we go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, hopefully, Barry's there. He just made a comment. So, I think he's there. You want to unmute and, and uh, open go. your camera? Unmuted. Excellent. Yeah, Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. That's up there. Right? Yep, we got it. I'm going to tell my computer not to shut off on me. Okay, thank you for having me speak at NOMS 2021. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't, but I am now with Florida Gulf Coast University. I've been here two and a half years. Um, they stood up something called the water school, and I was the first hire in it. And I lean them towards the freshwater side, even though most folks here are marine, because it's in Fort Myers, which is right on the coast. So first about cyanobacteria, you've heard a lot of this and that and the other thing. 
But I wanted to point out some things that I'd like to talk about that uh, people may not even think about. Yes, they're also known as blue-green algae. And when Ken and I were taking our phycology classes, we called them blue-green algae. And the reason we did is because they have chlorophyll A, like all the other regular eukaryotic algae. However, they are prokaryotes. No chloroplasts, no nucleus, no mitochondria. They do have ribosomes, but they are truly gram-negative bacteria. And they simply divide. Here's a new cell wall. This is a transmission electron micrograph. And they're just pinching in from one side to the other. Um, this is a, an EM of, of um, well, at the time it was Anabina. Hey, now Barry, you're, you're not advancing. I'm not? Oh, uh, oh it's because I'm advancing on the wrong one. Okay. You should have said that before. <laughs> hey. Okay, so there we go, right? There, yep. There's also... It, there's also a suggestion. There's a lot of echo. I don't know if you can get closer to it or there's something yeah, causing that. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I'm holding the speaker right in my face. So hopefully that's better. So the arrow is pointing to thylakoids. And that's where the, the molecules that are involved in photosynthesis are embedded. So although they don't have a chloroplast, they do have thylakoids. Again, here's simple division where the cells are simply pinching in um, from both sides. And this is a uh, the local sperm. So why are we concerned about cyanotrope? So let me ask you something about if I take off my headset and speak to my computer, maybe this is better. Is that, that better? Is, yes, that is better. All right, fine. <laughs> So um, we care about harmful algal blooms because of toxicity, yes. Um, hypoxia is where we have most of the action, where most of the fish kills come. It's typically not from toxicity. Hypoxia, of course, is low dissolved oxygen. You get a big enough bloom like this one in the Caloosahatchee River, the fish can't escape. At night, as they have talked about, they're metabolizing, they're utilizing the sugars they fix during the day, and that metabolism uses up the oxygen. Um, drinking water plants for many, many years have been worried about taste and odor compounds. If you have a surface water source, you get cyanobacteria, you get the two compounds of, that are most common, methyl isoborneol, or men in black for short, MIB, or geosmin. And aesthetics, now I don't get this aesthetics question. This looks perfectly nice to me. I can get a good sample. So what they look like. So these were taken with my iPhone. On the left is Gliotrichia, pretty easy to tell. It's like little pin cushions floating around. And on the right is Microcystis aeruginosa. Again, easy to tell because it's clathrate. As, as Andy talked about earlier, you've got these pockets of space in there. They move up and down in the water column because they have a gas vesicle. It's outlined in orange or yellow here. Um, it's all these hexagonal proteinaceous structures that fill with air and they come up and can regulate their buoyancy. This is for maximizing photosynthesis. They want to stay up in that photic zone. But that buoyancy, when they actually photosynthesize and they, they, and they make the photosynthate, the starch molecules are big enough to actually collapse the gas vesicle. The proteins are still there, but they collapse them and these organisms will sink back down to the bottom um, or into the thermal cline where nutrients might be being released like we've been talking about with Ken. Only selected genera have um, these particular gas vesicles. There's a lot of cyanobacteria do not. On the flip side, there are other regular bacteria that also have gas vesicles. What's interesting is that you cannot tell by looking at the organisms, even under the microscope, even if you get them to genus and species, whether or not they're making toxin. So Microcystis aeruginosa often is, but isn't always. And on the right, this is from Greg Boyer, my colleague from upstate New York. And he says, look, we, we really can't tell. So you have yes and no. And it has nothing to do with the species. It has a lot to do with the strain and also whether the conditions are right for those genes to be upregulated in the cells. 
So there's major groups of toxins. Um, for example, you've got the liver toxins or hepatotoxins. The microcystins, we think there's over 250 variants. And I'll go into this in more detail when I show you my, the uh, microcystins. Nodularin is in that same group, and so is cylindrospermopsin. Then you have the neurotoxins. And like it sounds, they go after nerves. They cause rapid nerve paralysis of skeletal and respiratory muscles. It can happen in minutes. I've heard of cattle drinking water and keeling over dying in, out west. So for there, you've got the anatoxin. You have the former anatoxin AS. It's been renamed to guanatoxin in 2020 because it reflects the structure of the molecule and it doesn't look like anatoxin at all. Saxatoxin is really a very potent toxin. It's one of the few that Homeland Security cares about. And neosaxatoxin is, a, is a, a derivative of that. You have toxins that can affect your skin, the lingvia toxins. Um, and there's a bunch more, the, the extracellular polysaccharides that there's a lot of them that we are just beginning to understand. They can also aggravate and cause rashes. There's a new compound, sort of 10, 12 years old, that people have been talking about, BMAA, which stands for N, uh, BN methylaminoalanine, and it's, it's co sister compound DABA. Um, it's an exo excitotoxin. It kills neurons and it's potentially linked to ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And then, of course, there's these, all these cyanopeptides well beyond the microcystins um, that some of them are protease inhibitors and they are to be determined. And some of them actually don't do any harm at all. So if you were trying to understand these compounds, and I want to point out, and Ken asked me to emphasize this once upon a time, it's exposure routes. These are not if you dip your hand in the water. You actually have to ingest these, and there's a little bit of work being done in aerosolization. There's some coming out on Lake Erie and some of the work that I'm doing down here. But these exposures that you see in the table are coming from the mouse model. It's hard to get humans to volunteer for this. So for example, it's lethal dose where 50% of the animals die, and it's microgram micrograms of toxin per kilogram of body weight. So saxotoxin, you can see, is the most toxic. Ones on the left, by the way, are all the cyanotoxins. Saxotoxin is the most potent. Um, and another natural toxin on the right is racine that comes from castor beans, even more potent than saxotoxin. Then guanotoxin um, is at 20 micrograms per kilogram body weight. Oh, well, that's the same as cobra toxin. So in our waters, when you have anatoxin AS or guanotoxin, you know, that's as potent as cobratoxin out there. Uh, pour me a stiff one, would you? Uh, microcystin LR is at 50, and it, it ranges a little bit. And then, but look at Karari. Karari is at 500. Strychnine is at 2,000. So microcystin LR, anatoxin A, nodularin matches up with microcystin LR and the cylindrospermopsins. So these are potent, potent compounds. But again, you have to be exposed to them. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. One of the things I like to point out is these are very, very large molecules inside the cells. They don't want to throw them away. It took a lot of energy to make them, and they typically don't leak out of live cells. There's no reason they would want to have such a big molecule pass through all the membranes that surround uh, cyanobacteria. Um, as a matter of fact, when we're analyzing these, we have to do physical or chemical lysis to break open the cells, freeze-thaw, sonication, bead beating, to get that intracellular toxin out of the cells. Um, and then the only other time you would see it is during a bloom die-off. And I know this bloom on the left is dying off because phycocyanin is bleeding out, this, this turquoise color that you see in the water, as well as all the fly larvae that are on there tell you that those cells lysed. So what is in the cell, how much is leaked out, and how much into the water is how you get to the analysis of toxin per liter. A lot of people are just doing that. They're just doing a freeze thaw. They're getting total microcystin or the other toxins per liter. 
not caring whether it's intracellular or, or leaked out into the water, because eventually the cells are going to die. This is important for drinking water plants too. If you're if you have a filtration system and you're filtering out cells that um, with high pressure and they have toxin, that toxin is going to leak out and go right by that filter. So it's important to know that. And drinking water plants pretty much know about this. So this is a perfectly healthy bloom lit up with epifluorescent microscopy. And I put this one in here because this is microcystis aeruginosa. And you see all those like reddish cells. Those cells are healthy. That's chlorophyll that's glowing. Um, actually, the pink cells are green algae that tend to hitchhike on microcystis. But the blue cells in what appear to be a healthy colony are cells that have lost their chlorophyll. And if they've lost their chlorophyll, that's a good hint that those cells are unhealthy. So even in a healthy colony, some of the cells are always dying. And you know, you can't analyze every single colony and figure out, okay, is this healthy and dying to get at how much toxin is leaking out? But that's kind of what we need to know. So all the cells in a colony are not in the same physiological state. That's just, just the nature of algae. Tell that to an engineer, they hate it. So microcystins, a little more detailed into them. Um, microcystin, microcystis aeruginosa is a non-nitrogen fixer. It's very common. It's also produced by a number of other species, not, uh, not other genera. There's Dilocospermums that make, which is a completely different order of cyanobacteria that make microcystins. Uh, we know planktothrix can make it almost all the time. I'd say 80% of the time you find planktothrix that's making it. And the molecules down here on the left, and the chemists have found out that if you have changes in the amino acids that are attached to this big molecule, you have all these different structural variants. And there is no way we could ever figure out the toxicity of each of those because it's very difficult to purify them. Um, the common theme for 85% of the microcystins is that they have the ADA group. So if you're using an ELISA test kit, which targets the ADA, and if you were buying kits, you'd see that most of them do, you know you're gonna pick up 85% of toxins. It's not as selective um, as, which is good, because that means you're, you're getting the full breadth of the toxins out there compared to LCMS MS, where we only have 12 known standards. It's called fast death factor. It's also, a, uh, it promotes tumor formation. So it's, it's not, um, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, cows are okay, you know, while they're drinking the water, but then they die overnight. And necropsies would show that they have a bloody liver. And I'm gonna show you why they have a bloody liver. So typically you have um, capillaries, which are one cell thick. And if you look in your liver, you've got a lot of capillaries. And what happens is the microtubules that hold a cell structure together it's basically the skeleton of a cell. They break down and are, are basically damaged by the microcystins. They interfere with it. So what happens is the capillaries pull apart from, you know, they don't hold a nice tight seal like a tube anymore, and blood seeps out. Um, Wayne Carmichael did this work, published it in 1994, where he was talking about all, well, the two cyanotoxins, really. So there we go. Why do they have bloody livers? because the capillaries pull apart. Um, and so that's how we can tell when we do necropsies on animals that they've been exposed to uh, microcystins. Um, it's a little trickier to actually analyze it in the tissue. Because of, um, really mostly because of uh, issues associated with this, started with Lake Erie, city of Toledo in, in 2014, there was a, an outbreak in Lake Erie and they told EPA to do something. So they convened a bunch of us together and we talked about this and they came up with a fairly conservative guideline. I didn't say regulation, it's a guideline for drinking water plants that use surface water. And for microcystins, it's 0.3 micrograms per liter for microcystin and they put the same, a different, you know, remember cylinders from Opsin not as potent as 0.7 micrograms per liter, but there's some caveats. It's for children younger than school age and the exposure has to be for 10 days. 
So that means you have a special tap that tells, well, you can't take that water from your tap. You know, I think that's kind of, uh, you know, that's the most conservative approach we have to use because they're telling everyone else, hey, you can take a higher dose. 1.6 micrograms per liter for microcystin for all our ages, three micrograms for cylinders from Mopsin. So again, EPA issued this health advisory, oh, I'd say about a little less than a year after the incident in Toledo's drinking water. So these are the drinking water guidelines. Not to be outdone, we now have recreational guidelines that came out about four years after that, again, from EPA. Um, and this is eight micrograms per liter of microcystin, 15 micrograms per liter for syringes from Opsin, all age groups. And this is a one-time exposure. So it is a, a different one, but again, it's out there as criteria. Um, and here's how you can get to that site. And then it's up to your states to figure out how they're gonna monitor this. In Florida, the Florida Department of Health actually would post a warning, but Florida Department of Environmental Protection would actually do the analysis. And they do theirs by LCMSMS. So again, microcystin exposure can lead to uh, polyps in your, uh, in your colon, skin papillomas. Um, you know, it's not something, and then, oh, there's a liver up there. I guess, that, I think that's a Chinese liver. So anyway, that's, um, not, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it was done by a study in China. All right, we're gonna move on to nodularin. And it's got that same ADA group over here on the left. It's, um, it's also made by non-ribosomal peptide. It's a non-ribosomal peptide. It's fairly common in brackish water. For example, uh, Great Salt Lake and Rodeo Lagoon. Great Salt Lake, of course, is in Utah. Rodeo Lagoon is in California. Um, one of the key organisms for making this is nodularia spumogena, but we're finding nodularia in a lot of water bodies. Um, a colleague of mine did a study of many, many water bodies. It's at low concentration, but we haven't really figured out who else is making it besides nodularia. So the hunt is on. I wanted to briefly, because everyone was talking about nitrogen fixation, I wanted to uh, show you some of my photographs and talk about it to a little greater extent because it's important. Um, the, the heterocyte, and the filamentous cyanobacteria, the Nostocales, is special because it makes a layer of lipid around that cell. You see that layer of lipid? Why? Because the nitrogenase complex is 60 separate enzymes that are inhibited by oxygen. So these cells start out colored, they start out green, and then they turn brown. Well, they do that by getting rid of the oxygenic, oxygenic portion of photosystem photosystem two, photosynthesis. They keep the energetic portion because fixing nitrogen is very expensive energetically. So you can see a visible change in the color because they've knocked out the oxygen generating portion. They keep making the ATP and NADPH. They have that extra layer of lipid around the outside. And you can see this picture by Hans over here where even the bacteria like attaching to those heterocytes. And of course, once they fix that nitrogen into ammonia, they can pass it on to amino acids and feed their neighboring cells. So how cool is that? N2, right from the air. So if nitrogen is limiting, these have a competitive advantage, this whole group. So we're talking to Locospermum, Cospidothrix, Raphidiopsis, Aphanozomenon, all of them have a great advantage because they can take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into amino acids. All right. Next, we have to, oh, and the reason I brought it in there is because remember I said there's a heavy nitrogen load needed to make microcystin. So it makes good sense that the, the Nostocheles that are making it, well, there's a, a ready source for making. Cylindros from Opsin is made by Aphanozomenon, Lingbia, Dilocospermum, Cylindros from Opsis, Raphidiopsis, whatever you want to call it. It's an alkaloid toxin. Um, it's not nearly as potent. Remember, it's 200 micrograms per kilogram of body weight. It's a liver toxin, causes liver necrosis, kidney effects, inhibition of protein synthesis. The thing about um, microcystins is that they do break down in the presence of chlorine. Enough chlorine 
a length of time of exposure to a chlorine, they'll break down. Whereas this one, this alkali toxin is very resistant to temperature, to pH. Um, a colleague of mine found it down core in the Everglades 4,700 years ago. So it's a very, very resilient molecule. Anatoxin A is on the left. It's an acetylcholine agonist, whereas guanatoxin is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Bottom line is they both interfere with the communication of the lung, the lung <clears throat> of the muscle to the nerves. Here's, <clears throat> here's another schematic that Wayne Carmichael put together that illustrates this, even though he's calling it anatoxin A because anatoxin A was renamed. Here's a normal nerve firing. If you don't know about this, nerves transmit information to muscles with acetylcholine, there's receptors on it. This is what has to happen. It breaks down, stops the firing. Well, anatoxin A inhibits that one way and anatoxin AS, guanatoxin inhibits it a different way. And this is called a very fast death factor versus fast, fast death factor. A little trickier type to diagnose. Anatoxin overall is a little more ephemeral in a water body that's just there for a small amount of time. Um, it can be bioaccumulated. I've seen it accumulated in zebra mussels. And again, it's, it's another potent toxin. These are both potent toxins we need to be concerned about. The saxitoxins, again, this is typically a marine situation. People talk about it in um, paralytic shellfish poisoning, right? So you say, oh, shellfish, and there's all sorts of programs to help you not eat bad shellfish. <clears throat> but the story is off a little bit on the freshwater. Again, we, we see in maybe 30% of the samples we look at, small amounts of saxitoxin. And we know the locus firmum, apanazomenon, raphidiopsis, microsera, planktothrix, and cuspidothrix are just some of the candidate organisms for making it. As a neurotoxin, it blocks that voltage gate sodium channel and it causes respiratory failure. So again, this is the one that the Department of Homeland Security is most concerned about of all the cyanotoxins. And finally, I think finally, talking about BMAA. So BMAA illustrated in the top is an amino acid, but it's not one of our amino acids. It's a non-protogenic amino acid. It's one that cyanobacteria make, but we don't make that amino acid. We have 20 amino acids. So we think most all cyanobacteria may make this. Um, and DABA is a metabolite of BMAA. And the thing is, it looks and can mimic alanine in susceptible people. So that's the concept is that this could get into someone. It could be accidentally incorporated. And remember the protein structure and how that protein folds on itself is a function of the amino acid sequencing. So if you are putting BMAA in instead of alanine, you could be causing a problem there. Um, the concept is, does BMAA get across the blood-brain barrier? So as you're making proteins in the brain, do we, are we interfering with some of that protein synthesis or is it a straight out toxin? The environmental, I mean, the uh, medical community is pretty torn up about this. Half say it is, half say it isn't. So I, I don't really know, but we did this study describing is exposure to cyanobacteria an environmental risk factor for ALS? and other neurodegenerative diseases. And the story still goes on because Greenwater Labs, where, where Andy works, they've analyzed 78 samples for me of blooms, of cultures of cyanobacteria. Free BMAA has not been found in a single sample. This is over a two year period. Um, so I, I'm now a skeptic that this is um, truly an issue, but I'm funded to find out. So we'll find out more and we'll figure out if we can find some, some BMAA. So again, you have water advisory signs that go up and usually that's your department of health. This came from Lake Erie. You have to alert the public because it's still their choice to go in. You can't usually not keep them from going in. I've heard of Copco Reservoir out in Oregon where 4th of July, you're not gonna stop anybody from going in that, in that water no matter how green it is. But they do say 
and they do register these um, beach closures, and you can go look at those data. So some of the issues that happen is, let's say you have a, a nice initial distribution of blue-greens in the lake. They've already floated up for the day. They came up for their morning sun. But that buoyancy could really get them up there. They're all competing. Hey, I want to get at the top. And so there's a lot of them up at the top. And if you just think about the cells and you had so much micrograms per liter and you go from 100,000 cells to 10 million cells, you've now had a, a force factor multiplying the amount of toxin up there. And then the wind blows, and they are very easily moved around by the wind. And you have your 100 million cells that blew up on a shoreline, and you have you know, 20,000 micrograms per liter of toxin. So it's, it's not a good thing. And that's what, you know, you have to, Ann talked about this earlier, about where do you sample? So sample where you're most concerned. If I went out on this bottom image and took a sample from the middle of the lake, I'd say, well, it's almost no microcystis, microcystis here at all. Why are we worried? But yet kids could be playing on the shoreline. And it's not just kids. It's also important to drinking water facilities. So this is Lake Mead. It's probably way out of date because is there any water left in Lake Mead? I don't know. But um, so if you have the ability to change different intakes um, to move away from a bloom, fantastic. Burlington, Vermont has that. But if you go further up north in Vermont, the smaller city, the three smaller towns don't have any way of doing it. They change their filters twice a week. I mean, it's, it could be bad. So if you are dealing with a water treatment plant, surface water where there's blooms, you have to take advantage of no, knowledge that you have and use and move your water sources around. There's a great article. It's, it's you know, I call it What Lies Beneath. So the microcystins are the tip of the iceberg. And then you have all these other compounds, the cyanopeptides um, that, that we know a lot less about what their effects are, poorly studied. Um, the only problem I have with this, this is called uh, a graphical abstract. There's something over here. These are granum. Granum are stacks of thylakoids you only find in green algae and, and, and others, but you never find them in cyanobacteria. So anyway. So quickly on toxin detection, you have analytical methods, you have ELISA, which is immuno, um, immuno enzyme-linked immunoassay. They basically raise antibodies to these compounds and have linked that to um, something that, that gives off a color that you can read in a machine. There is liquid chromatography coupled with mass spectroscopy, and sometimes you can do LC-MS-MS. And that's really the most sophisticated way of measuring these toxins, although you do have to have samples of the toxins that are purified so that you can compare what you're finding to that. And like I said, for microcystins, we have about 12. So you could never measure all the others, but maybe they're less important. The lysis is fairly economical. You can buy a, a, a plate with 96 wells in it, which means you have 40, because you do it in duplicate required, and then there's the, the standard curve for about six, $700 if you have the plate reader and other things. LCMS MS gets much more expensive to run. The machines are more expensive, and even the chemicals for, for using them are more. So ELISA test kits are available for microcystins and nodularians. They're, they're lumped together for saxitoxin, anatoxin A, and cylindros from opsin. And again, they find they get, there are also rapid test kits that can tell you positive or negative. They're trying to say that they're somewhat um, quantitative, but they're really not so quantitative. So you can get these dipstick methods. And you know, it's the ones that test for ADA, again, pick up 85% of the microcystin congeners. And again, if you were looking, you can do a little bit better with LCMS MS as far as getting down into the nanogram level, which is great, and, but you have to have all these other compounds to spike. And that's why it gets expensive, because you have to buy these purified forms to spike when you put in your natural sample to figure out how things are doing. And DL's detection limit. So you can get pretty, pretty finely tuned. 
And again, just, just some more, here are some of the standards you can purchase. And, and the results look something like this. You get these peaks and you compare the peaks. And again, the references, there's only 12 of them. Some of the newer techniques that we're using um, is looking at genes, because even though you can't say whether those genes are being expressed, if the genes are there, there's a possibility that they could be, be being expressed. And I'm very interested in working on upregulation and downregulation of those toxin genes. We've got field and laboratory studies going on with that. So here's the genes, here's the gene sequence. It's actually, it's a complex for microcystin. And you need all of these, you know, MCYG to, to C. And here's nodularin. And we've got this worked out for all all the major toxins, maybe not, uh, maybe not guanotoxin. No, I think we do have it for guanotoxin too. Again, this gets you the potential producers, but not necessarily the toxin. And just briefly how you do it, you basically have to extract the DNA, you denature it, and then you anneal it and, oops, and then you can do um, CRISPR or PCR, I've got a cat visitor. Sorry. All right. So what do we know? Environmental triggers for toxin production. No, nope, we don't know that yet. Reasons for high variability of impact on fish and vertebrate. No, nope, we don't know that yet. Actual degree of impact on humans. I, I think it's underreported. I think CDC would admit to that. Are more algae producing toxins or are we just detecting it? And I think there's a paper that just came out that are blooms really more evident now, or are they actually more blooms? Um, yeah, it was a, a fair number of heavy hitters reporting in that paper. So bottom line is, when you go swimming, lifeguard has, is not on duty, the bacteriologist, the microbiologist, and the people that have been teaching you this course were phycologists, not on duty. So swim at your own risk. Own, own risk. And finally, the real reason to study cyanobacteria and work on them is that they are living art. This is a gliotrichia. It's been boiled for at least five minutes, maybe 15 minutes. You can see the chlorophyll is still intact because there's a lot of mucilage around these filaments. And all the bright um, green are bacteria that have been lit up. It's a DNA stain called cytox green. So, even though it got boiled and the bacteria gave way, the gliotrichia is quite resistant. That mucilage is very protective for them. All right, thank you very much. And here's my contact information. And I said, I, this is, by the way, a new species I found in the Everglades of gliotrichia. Um, the world's top cyanobacteria person confirmed it for me. Um, but I say, send me samples. And I want to see what you have. And you have to send me stuff live so I can photograph it and work on the taxonomy of North American cyanobacteria. Thank you. Hey, Barry, I got some questions for you. Um, yeah. One thing I want to point out, though, in this image, see how that's twisted? Uh, Gloria trichia does that. And what gets preserved in the sediments is not the aconite, but the basal sheath. Um, just saying. So, so, yeah, this one, it, it was attached. So it's got a weird basal blue, um, maybe a, a, an aconite or I don't know. And then there's got this big fat one here and then this separation disc and then a heterocyte. And it tapers, it's about a millimeter and a half long. It's kind of crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So how do successive free thaw, freeze thaw cycles affect the increase in assay toxin? So each successive so it, one. Yeah, you're, you're basically rupturing the cells to get all the toxin out. Because after you do the freeze thaw, you actually have to go through a filtration to get the particulate out. So that's three freeze thaws is the standard. Um, and it works better than a chemical extraction. So do you, do you feel like you get it all out after three or is that just yes. the standard? Okay. Yes, but well, that's the standard, but you know, so what if you did four? Well, we, we found out that one and two are really good, but three is kind of like the icing on the cake. Cool. Yeah, I don't think you'd get any more after three. 
All right. Um, and this is kind of, I think, a general question for all of us. I actually uh, reviewed this paper. Um, any additional thoughts on rapid test strips for toxins? Uh, the Duke et al. The Duke et al. Uh, last year had some information, but curious about opinions. So I'll, I'll let you guys talk about your opinion, then I'll talk about mine. Well, you know, the good part is if I want to not spend a lot of money up front on doing an analysis, the sample comes in and I, and I do the dipstick on it. Oh, yeah, it's got microcystin. Then I can go forward with doing something with it or not. And, I've, and I just brought in the saxitoxin strips. I haven't started using them yet. Um, we have done the saxitoxin strips uh, we and, and the antitoxin A. Um, we have yet to get a hit. Uh, with those. Um, control line can be a problem because uh, you're always comparing it to the control line. And so, uh -huh. yeah, I think, I think as a, as a um, screening tool, it's nice. Uh, it gives you kind of a go, no go kind of answer. But if, if we detect with the strip, we always uh, send it off to, to somebody like uh, Greenwater because they're not, they are very rough back of the hand estimates. Yep, yep I agree. Yeah, um, and the, 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 so like Greg Boyer gives a good talk comparing all the different methods for toxin measurement. And, you know, bottom line is some data are better than no data, or you got to be careful not to be misled. So you have to think through the risk of false positives versus false negatives. But as a screening tool, I like it because frankly, we're, we're not getting enough toxicity data. The, the way the regulatory stuff is set up, you start posting lakes when you hit cell concentrations. It's got nothing to do with toxin, really. And so we're not finding out what we need to know. Right. If everybody had the money to send them out to good labs, that would be wonderful. But we don't. So you <laughs> settle for what you can get. Exactly. Exactly. Um, OK, somebody had asked about uh, the CAS. Um, you have one of those, don't you, Barry? Yep, I have a CAS cube. Um, Wonderful. So Wonderful. Uh, there were some folks who were working on um, adding it to their labs. Uh, Angel is uh, Santiago is one of those folks. So his contact information, well, you have it, I think, as one of the attendees. I think I gave you guys the attendee list, but um, he also put in the chat. Um, so do you have a feeling about how you like that CAS so far? It's fantastic. But keep in mind, you know, besides that initial purchase price, which isn't that bad, there is um, a, an annual maintenance fee if you want to keep it, you know, it's about $5,800 a year. There's also, um, you have to buy little vials and there's other things besides the cubes, the cube itself and the plates. And of course, it's always easier to run a full plate um, but it, it's, it's nice and, it, and you have to do it in duplicate. So you have 96 wells, but you actually have to use two tubes um, for each run of, of a particular site. It's, it's a requirement. So there aren't 80 slots left over after the standard curve. There's only 40. So other than that, yeah, it's, it's I could not imagine anyone, my students, we, we have, we're sitting there, we've got eight runs to do between now and the end of the year, 30, 320 samples we have to run. So we never could have done those by hand. Yeah. Um, this is actually one for, for all of us, but I, I have my own opinion. So what's the use of a fluorescent measurement, if phycocyanin, for example, if it doesn't get at what's in the cells? Well, you're not, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not necessarily measuring it for that reason. That's it. What's, what's the use? If you want to know what's in the cell, yeah, you're right. It's not useful, but that's not why people do it. You know, for, for those of us that are into taxonomy, we would like to see what's in the sample, look at it, get measurements and so on, but not everybody can do that. The fluorescence measurements give you a surrogate, not a perfect one by any means, but a surrogate that lets you know if you've got an issue. So again, it's a screening tool. I tell people it's fine to use the combined probe that gives you chlorophyll and phycocyanin, and when you get a hit that looks like you may have blue greens, that's when you get a sample and start taking action. Check it out, find out what's in it, do a toxicity test, test all those things. But it's it's an early warning, like anything else. It's not the end point of its own. Yeah, and those probes uh, tend to get overwhelmed by uh, picoplankton, 
And so if you have a lot of small planktors that are fluorescing, um, phycocyanin uh, probes get overwhelmed and they have to be recalibrated constantly. So and, um, and we use ours to trigger ozonation. We're using a nanobubble generator. We, and when we get uh -huh. a high enough uptick in the phycocyanin because we have real time buoy out there, we, we kick in the ozone remotely. So. Um, another question, how long do toxins stay in the environment? Basically, I'm asking how frequent your reservoir sampling has to be in order to catch the toxin in the water. Is monthly sufficient? No. <laughs> Somebody asked earlier about yeah, yeah. duration time, and it, it varies. The lip barrier deal with it, but yeah. Yeah, so we know that there are certain bacteria that will chew up some of these toxins. Um, there's a whole host that are, are, are very good at doing that. However, they have to be there. And the conditions have to be just right for them to, to find those molecules. So we know certain compounds last a long time. The, the cylindrous form options last a long time. I think the anatoxins, not so much. Um, and microcystins, you know, Jim Haney up in, up, up in your neck of the woods, how far north is that? New Hampshire, it, right? He's yeah. shown that, that those can last quite a while in the sediments. So as far as the beach goes, what about circulation? You got all these other confounding things. So sample often. Yeah. And, and the, the specific question is monthly sampling enough? No. No. No, yeah. absolutely not. Yeah, if I were managing for, uh, for a beach, I would be managing um, weekly. And then uh, Zoe was asking kind of along that line, how long does it take to get a result for quantifying toxin for managing a beach? So if you're using sticks and you wanna be ultimately, ultimately conservative, you'll know right away. If you're gonna send it off to a lab, um, generally turnaround is a few days to a week. Andy, how fast are you guys? Uh, it depends. I mean, in the middle of we turn around the same day. You know, if it's a, you know, whenever, whenever it's potentially human health, situation. I mean, you know, it goes to the front of the line, obviously. Um, so we can do same day uh, or next day, depending on when we receive the sample. If we get the sample in the morning, possibly by the end of the day, because uh, our days don't end in normal time. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think the hard part for us is uh, we, uh, especially with the way shipping is right now, is that uh, there's a holding time on live samples and we'll get them hours late. Um, you know, we'll get them at four or five in the afternoon and it makes it almost impossible to get those analyzed in a timely manner. Right. Um, okay. Uh, here's a question and I, I hope I'm not butchering this. Um, uh, phycomycin treatment uh, was used after cyanobacteria with microcystins was confirmed by County Health Department, 22 acre groundwater lake. Did we help ourselves or hurt ourselves? I'm not familiar with phycomycin. Yeah. No, I don't. I mean, it's obviously, it's fungal treatments, I guess, to attack the pollutants, but I don't know anything about it either. Yeah, I don't either. Guessing. So, I, I grow a lot of algae. When people send me stuff, I actually isolate the organisms. I use cyclohexamide to suppress all the eukaryotic forms. Right. We've done that to purify it's, 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 it's great. It's, it's helps a lot. It's like, nasty stuff, though. Yeah, a little pinch between the cheek and gums. <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah, gene alteration. Me. Oh, all right. Hang on. I got it. I, I had to look it up. Phycomycin is a trade name for a uh, peroxide. Oh. oh right. Forget everything, Forget everything we said. I don't know what it was. Yeah, I was thinking it was some sort of bioagent. It, it's peroxide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a peroxide That's what I was thinking, yeah. Actually, you probably didn't hurt yourself at all. Uh, yeah, you, know, you may have oxidized some of the toxins. Yeah, yeah, because it'll think it actually necessarily. It may not have helped as much as you want, but I think it was probably not a bad thing at all. Because copper doesn't do anything to the toxin, right? So peroxide right. will actually act on some of the free toxin. You know, and, and there's some doubt about that too. By the way, I, I'm not. Yeah, so it's sure, not but... going to get them all. But yeah, it, no. it points. I don't think it would be harmful. Now, if you if you kill them and you lice a lot of cells and you're putting it in the water column. You can have the debate of, well, okay, I did that in one quick burst, as opposed to letting them all die off and gradually release it. Is it really any better? I don't know. And I think it really, it's an it depends type question. Yeah, it really depends too on how high the toxin was, right, in the water at the time. So, yeah. And, and well, now I know with- are, are more vulnerable because they don't have the uh, ROS capability that eukaryotic organisms have. Now, right. it does, but I, I can 
dioxide does hurt the very small zooplankton. So if you care about the protozoa and the rotifers, then you don't want to use it. But the clodosterins don't seem to mind or the pilopods. So Caitlin um, Chamberlain, who's from Minnesota, is asking, in order to make decisions for beach closures based on microcystin and cylinder spermopsin results, would it be best to, oh, this is a good question, to not freeze, uh, do not do free cycles at all then to see if the level of toxicity of the natural state? So, no, so free, free no, samples. Because that, that is, you know, you want to know how much is in the water because you don't know how much a kid is going to swallow. And it doesn't matter if it's in the water or it's free or not. Cells. Yeah, you just you just want total. And it's the same with yeah, it's same with dogs with wildlife. They're gonna they'll be exposed to everything, not just to um, not just to what's contained in in cells. Yeah, so you want to lyse all the cells yeah. and sample them, get total. Yeah. So Zoe, I know that there's more than one manufacturer for selling the sticks. The ones that we buy are Braxis. Um, does Envirologic still make sticks, Barry and Andy? I don't know. I don't know. I, just, I got some from a Dutch guy gave me a bunch of microsystem that, that actually heats up the sample. It actually has an exothermic reaction as this little vial. And then you stick your stick in it after that. Hmm. Is that brand new? It's it's uh, Dutch. I can I can just some Dutch guy you ran into in the street. I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they, they call me. Very stealing said, Dutch microsystem sticks on they the said, hey, market. You, have you ever tried our, our stuff? And I said, I think I got a couple. And they said, Oh, if, we're gonna send you a lot. They sent me a box of 25 kits. So anybody want to try one? I'll be glad to send it out to you. I'll try one. <laughs> um and Abraxas is now owned by Eurofins in case you have trouble locating the, the link to that. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think I've answered all the questions. Somebody had asked a question about Seixing, but I think we, we answered that uh, pretty well. Um, so are there other questions about actually anything that we've covered? Anybody wanna unmute and ask a question? I'm not seeing anything. You guys are fried, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long week. It has, and I I haven't even gotten to do that much. It's been a long week. Um, I mean, I watched I watched intermittently trying to trying to get on and watch. Actually, the plenary last night was quite good. The ending plenary is quite good. Um, well, that's all the material that we have, unless somebody would like to see another taxa on the microscope, or somebody has a question for one of us. I actually got through that faster than you've ever had done. Yeah. Well, you were quicker on ecology and you didn't do the periflatin part. True, I didn't, um, but it wasn't in the, actually and it was I, very, I that was fast. I streamlined the management methods as yeah, well. I was right on time. <laughs> I can show you an eight eat germinating. Oh, do, do that. Oh, All go right. ahead, Karen. Question. Yeah, I have a quick question too. We, we're just starting um, on Hyde Lake. This is in upstate New York, um, near the St. Lawrence to do some sampling um, and write up a lake management plan. And the, um, the sample that was taken on September 8th was rather strange and, and took our um, lake water consultant back. I'm just curious what your tech take might be on it. The thing that was most striking about the sample was that the ammonia level was really high at, at the surface or towards the surface you know, it was 171 micrograms of nitrogen per liter. And then down below at five meters, and this lake doesn't get that deep, it's about 18 feet. Um, it was 200 and almost 250 micrograms of nitrogen per liter. Um, our total phosphorus, well, let me see. Yeah, uh, yeah, our total phosphorus was in the magnitude of 30 micrograms phosphorus per liter. So you just have a little bit of a sense. Um, and it, it, the dissolved oxygen um, on that particular day was low throughout the water column at about six mi um, micrograms per liter. What, when you see a high ammonia like that, and it, it, there was hardly any detectable nitrate, I'll add, what could be going on in your well, mind? Hey, back, back up a second. You said micrograms per liter, right? Yes. 
That's not really a high number. Okay. No, that I mean, it's not nothing by any means, but anything okay. under, a, well, you could have unionized ammonia at only 0 0.02 milligrams or 20 micrograms per liter, and that could be toxic. But okay. 170, 200, you know, whatever micrograms yep. per liter of ammonium is not really a big number. 0.3 okay. is where it starts to raise eyebrows. 0.6 ah. is up there and one is screaming. But okay. the answer is you had to have low oxygen because otherwise that ammonium would get translated into uh, nitrate pretty quickly, or you had right. to have decomposition happening faster than the stuff could get converted. Okay, uh, all right, good, that's good to hear. Yeah, we did have low DO. Um, it looked like the lake had maybe mixed. It's like I said, it's shallow, and if, um, the DO was low kind of throughout the water column, yeah. so. All right, so that isn't that high. That's good to know. I mean, not having ammonia and not having nitrate is usually indicative of low oxygen. Low oxygen. Okay, so that's not so surprising. Oh, thank you so much. Yep. So is this your germinating aconite? Yeah. So you see, these are all germinating, but the one on the upper left, you can see the, it pinching in. And if I go back, you can see your slides. Do you see all these achenes? I found some. I'm looking. I go, wait, there's some that are in the middle of dividing. Wow. Right? I had never seen that before. You always hear about them germinating, but <sighs> so it's just early and it's still in the in the bottle that they came in. So it's just interesting. Because the filaments are all gone. You know, it's 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 only achenes that are left in, in the sample. Yeah. But it and was that, uh, it was this was it initially a little bit from planktonicum. Pretty cool. Really? Had a little microcystis in there, and now there's still plenty of microcystis in the bottle. There they were. I said, I've got to take pictures of that. Who knows when I'll be able to share them? So yeah. Well, there, here we are. Um, uh, actually, uh, Angel's asking. Uh, Angel's asking, does the freezing uh, time affect the lysing process, and therefore the recoveries? Would it make a difference using dry versus liquid ice? Well, this you should answer this question, Barry. Nitrogen, for example, and then warming it in a water bath at 37 degrees C to reduce the freeze-thaw cycle time. Oh yeah, you can you can freeze it as fast as you want to. We throw ours in our minus 80 and pull them out. Um, the thawing part. Yeah, 37 is okay. Room temperature is probably better. And the same thing with the kits from Eurofins. You've got to bring those up to room temperature because you keep those in the, not minus 80, but you keep those frozen too. And you have to- Ari, unless you're in witness protection, push your computer screen up a bit. <laughs> we're only seeing the bottom half. Of you. you know, I, I bought this stupid Amazon, you know, thing. Remember they couldn't sell them. So when I finally got one, it's got the worst clip in the world in the back. You know, I, I'm holding <laughs> it. I taped it on earlier. But... <laughs> Duct tape, man. Oh, okay. man. Now you can see my ceiling fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there any comment about long-term monitoring if uh. lake surface samples or depth integrated samples? Uh, Epilimnetic samples are preferred. Um, I get sent both. It depends on your sampling goals. It really depends on your question. Um, if you're if you want to know what's happening at you know up in the top, generally surface samples are taken at half a meter. So if you kind of want to know what's going up in the top versus the you know epilimnetic or photic zones, so you get more average water conditions. Um, or take both. I get both from some of the projects that I count for. <laughs> Yeah, we try to do is standardize one way of taking them for a project, which may vary by the goals. But typically with, you know, volunteers collecting them with sample kits, they're going to get a sample from the upper foot or two of water. But if we think there's a reason to believe there's something going on throughout the epilimion getting a core, it's not hard to do with a piece of plastic hosing or whatever. And then if we think there's hap something happening around the thermocline, and that's usually best done by having oxygen and temperature profiles, it's nice to get one at the thermocline as well. 
now you need a sampler to do that. But you, you kind of have to decide what the goals are, but the more the better. Yeah, the um, that surface sample is pretty much uh, going to be your high point. So if you're doing depth integrated samples or you're doing, you know, uh, some kind of pooling, that's going to even out your concentration to be much more indicative of lake wide or at least open water concentrations. Um, and uh, long term monitoring is awesome. <laughs> okay, stick tests or toxin specific, yes. Would you recommend focusing on microsystems or using them all? Um, okay, so here's the deal. Uh, microcystin is the most prevalent toxin, and if you have limited resources, I would I would um, go for microcystin stick tests. If you uh, you know I we, as I said, we have not had a positive hit on any of our anatoxin A sticks ever. Um, but that's a much more convoluted process. We have to preserve the sample and then run it. Uh, you know, probably slender spermopsin would, I, I don't know, saxitoxin maybe would be the next most. I don't know. Andy, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. We, we always look at a sample quickly before we do anything with it. So we right. know, what, you know, we look for PTOX, uh, you know, just a quick like 100, 100x set of reactor scan and we look and see what's there. So we know what we're, you know, what toxins to look for essentially. But, you know, obviously you're just sampling the lake and you can't do that then. I agree. Certainly, microcystin would be would be the number one for sure. That's definitely the most common toxin we get. Um, after that, yeah, I mean, they're all about. The, I mean, just you don't know. We get sax tox, we get antoxin. You know, we get them all. So, yeah, yeah. That, I, yeah they, it, again, it comes down to resources and goals. The problem, yeah. from my yeah. perspective, is if if there is a bloom going on, and dogs are dying, and this has happened, it's probably right. not from microcystin. It's, no, be, so it's no. a nerve toxin, and you need to look for that. Um, yeah. In New England, the most common death-causing cyanobacterium is planktothrix. That's the one we've had the most trouble with. Yeah. And it's not as easily, I mean, it's not hard to identify, but because it got split off of oscillatoria, people don't really know what it is. And they think right away they have anabana, not up on the delicious sperm part yet. And they're only well, looking for microsystems. It doesn't form surface scums either, so it's, that makes it tricky. So. Right, it does, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I would say microcystin stick tests are the most helpful um, just because of all the steps with the anatoxin A, even though it seems to be the second most likely detect. Um, I'm just not comfortable. If I suspect there could be anatoxin A um, and we get zero on a stick test and there's a dog death, I would send it off to Andy's lab yeah, sure. and ask him to test for sex toxin and anatoxin A. Um, Cylinder spermopsin is out there, but it's it's totally hit and miss, don't you think, Andy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like I said, because it appears like a lot of the Raffiti Ops isn't even really producing it. So I think it's more the, the you know, the crisis form is the and main. Umzekia yeah. can also make and, it, yeah. What was that? Umzekia can also make it, right? I'm probably saying that wrong. Umzekia. Umzekia? Umzekia? Can't that oh, also make yeah. it? I mean, yeah. I've never seen that outside of Japan. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in pictures. Yeah, no, there, there's a few other. We we we've seen a, a strain of uh, dog sperm and Lermani out yeah. in Washington produced. So you, you know, wow. that's the thing. They're constantly finding, and you know, Barry would, would know. I mean, new stuff producing stuff. All you know, new oh, toxins, yeah. new species producing new toxins. So you almost just have to say it could be it could be any any sign that could produce anything at any time. I mean, that's I mean, kind of have to go over that. I mean, we didn't talk about lateral lateral gene transfer. And we now know that's the case too. Some of these genes have been passed around amongst, even, even over to the dinoflagellates. We think saxitoxin was given to the dinoflagellates from the cyanobacteria. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna go back. So Zoe was uh, saying that she's in Quebec and they've not had a report of sickness due to recreational usage at their beach, but they close it quite often. Um, you know, and I know that uh, if we close it for nothing or or on the other side for long enough. I, I never, um, I think that being cautious with human health is a good thing. And so these are the toxins we know about. And if you have a cyanobacterial bloom that's enough to cause concern, you probably don't want people in the water because even the polysaccharides in the sheath will irritate people's skin. Um, 
And I know that a lot of the, some of the systems I've worked in in Canada, prairie pot lakes and things like that consistently have blue green blooms that kill livestock. So, you know, I think you're better to err on the side of caution, honestly. If in doubt, yeah. keep out. Yeah, when in doubt, yeah, keep the, out. The, the yeah. tough call there, yeah, is, you know, is it, is it for nothing? Well, of course not, you're being protective. The question is, how protective should you be? You know, and, and I, are, when you're saying you're closing the beach, are you actually saying, sorry, you can't go in here? Because like in, in Massachusetts, the state can post the beach. They cannot close it. It's a public lake. Anybody can go in there if they want. If you're foolish enough to jump in a bloom, okay. Uh, that, that's Darwinian evolution, I guess. But <laughs> She um, said they close they, it. Yeah. They don't actually close anything. They just post it. And posting it saying, we're not comfortable. We think there may be a problem here. It's never a bad idea. Yeah. Hey, uh, Zoe, wh wh uh, what are you basing the closures on? Is it is it total cyanobacteria and cell numbers or? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what they do. They get 70,000 cells per milliliter yeah, of a potential see. toxin producer. They post it. Well, but it, but is it? But sometimes then they're not. They're just doing total. So they could be like a fan of capsa and they, they close. Oh, oh it. yeah. Oh, well, I'm not saying they do it well. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's my. It's always been My a problem. push has been happened. that should be the trigger to do something, not to post it and walk away. But that's how it gets done here. Visual and a lot of states do that as well. Yeah. Now, New York has a more progressive okay. program. They look at visual stuff, cell counts, toxicity. They try to make it progress. They do a better job with that. Of course, they've also had some pretty big issues lately that have brought it to the public forefront. Uh, they're not as excited about it in Massachusetts. Yeah, she says they use a, a grading system, one, two A and two B, which is not necessarily bad. You know, you can you have a pretty good sense of, OK, there's a lot of scum, a little scum or not much scum at all. And right. um, you use the tools you have. Right. As long as you're consistent, yeah. your grading system, I think, yeah. you know, that's the but best I mean, you can do. It, I had a situation about a decade ago where there was an Afanazomenon floss aqua bloom in a New Jersey lake and it was absolute pea soup and they had a swim club in there. I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I, you just this is just risky and of course as we kind of know antibody plus aqua doesn't really produce very much toxin so they got it tested there was nothing wrong and they said what's the matter with you you're, you're scared everybody for no reason here sorry i just <laughs> did people get rashes though did they get skin rashes from swimming in that um stuff? i didn't hear anything about it yeah um because some people can um so also there was a question about when blue, when green or blue green algae first appear in the season, what agency should the Lake Association reach out to for immediate help? It totally depends on where you live. You know, some health departments can be helpful. Um, often it starts with your county health department if you think you have a toxigenic bloom. Um, uh, some states like Michigan uh, is pretty poor on average, but uh, the last time we reported a bloom uh, that was just incidentally, we, we found it incidentally. Um, one of my techs reported it. She actually got good follow-up, which was encouraging because Michigan doesn't have much of a, much of a um, construct in Eagle to handle uh, cyanobacterial blooms at all. Some states like Utah and uh, Idaho um, have really uh, well-specified programs. And I think it hinges between their uh, DNR and their health departments. Go, go back to Zoe's thing. She's got a follow-up saying they close it based on visual inspection and they reopen it after 24 hours of clear water. The algae could die and the toxin could still be there. So 24 hours is a little risky. Yeah, I would, I would go with three days to or a That's week. exactly what I would have said, three days. Yeah. But again, it's protective. Is it absolutely necessary? That's a judgment call. Yeah. Okay, good conversations. Anybody else? There's some question about whether people got materials or not. Everything was sent. So if somebody didn't have it, do get in touch. The one person that uh, had question at this time actually went back and checked and they did have the email. So I sent out the links to the materials on Saturday. Um, if you didn't get it, just email me because um, I'm the one who sent the link to this. So I know you have my email uh, and I'll resend the, uh, they were two separate emails. So I'll resend the one with the materials. I have a couple of references. One of them is the, um, the document that Andy and uh, Amanda Foss maintained from green water of toxigenic algae and what toxins they produce. And uh, it's off, up on ResearchGate, but I've 
downloaded it and I'll send that to folks. I'm gonna, it will take a fair bit of time um, for this to write to uh, file. And so once that's all done, I'll send out the link for Monday's workshop to the Monday folks and today's workshop to the Friday folks. The Monday workshop is partial because of my loss of internet, but it doesn't look like this had any issues at all. And then everybody should have all the, should have additional resources and then all of the uh, presentations for whichever day or both that you uh, attended. <laughs> I'm sorry, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, Shannon, it's nothing a good drink won't cure. <laughs> so I have to tell you the thing I always tell the kids when I'm talking to kids, um, uh, uh, why I'm a biologist. And so we talk about environmental science and, you know, there's something for everybody. There's chemistry, there's physics, there's social sciences, there's economics. And I'm like, and I'm a biologist and I'm a biologist because one plus one never equals two. <laughs> they're like, what? That's right. <laughs> it's true. So, all righty. And then you're welcome to email us with questions as well. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate thank it. You. And thank you, thank Ken, you, and Andy, and Barry. Good time as always. Yeah. yeah. And that's right. the end of the NOMS conference. That is the end of the NOMS conference. Yeah, close that. So Hopefully live in color it. next year in Minneapolis. God, let's hope so. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. Get me out of my office, please. <laughs> I went out of my damn basement. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll see you all guys. Right. Take care, everybody. Take care, all. All right. Bye. Bye.